Coming up this week on the Markcast. Oh my God, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. Uh, depending on who you talk to here, uh, XFL uh, ratings are plummeting, cratering, declining. I have seen more articles than I could count this week. A lot of them shared by our friends to the North Up in Canada. We are here, XFL 2023, week six. We've made it halfway through the XFL season. Uh, just not good enough. We're up against March Madness now. Ratings are terrible. The, the end is nigh. Everything else. Uh, ESPN, supposedly, we're happy with everything. So today on the podcast this week, we are asking the question. You've already seen the meme. XFL, is this fine? This is fine. I'm okay with the events that are unfolding currently. I've already tweeted this is an all-time episode this week. First and foremost, from ESPN and XFL sidelines, we have Stormy Bonatoni joining us. Stormy, all in on the XFL season. Love getting her inside perspective here. Storylines of the season. She's covering the big Monday night game this week. You know, Roughnecks at Defenders. What does Stormy think of all this? When you talk to a lot of the players, or at least that I have throughout the course of the season, they genuinely feel a connection to ownership where I'm not sure that that's been the case in, in previous iterations. And they feel heard, they feel seen, they are so fortunate for every opportunity. Like every week that I'm doing the one-on-one -on -one phone calls with these players, they're just over the moon appreciative to be talking to us, to be sharing their stories, to be having more eyeballs on them. It's been really cool. And then two fantastic XFL player interviews this week, courtesy of the league. If you're a fan of the Houston Roughnecks, XFL 2023, you're going to want to hear from this man. If you are a fan of the XFL Dragons back in 2020, you are also going to want to hear from this man. But especially if you are a fan and listener of this podcast, you are going to want to hear from this man. Brandon Silvers, formerly known as Chase and Nick on our podcast, The Bachelorette Fame. Brandon Silvers joining the show. How the heck are you? I just wanted to get back playing football the way I knew I could and being in a system that fits me and not just some random, random, you know, deal. So for me right now, it's just playing in this system and having fun with the guys and, you know, scoring a ton of points, which we are right now, and then winning games. I know that for me, that's just my goal. You know, my goal was just to win games and play good football. And, you know, we'll see what happens next. And then so glad the Vipers set this up. Jeff Bidette here, wide receiver, coming off a huge weekend last week with our you know, friend of the show, Luis Perez. Talking with Jeff Bidette, the no longer winless Vipers. We're checking in, seeing how he's doing. Going into the season, I had no uh, expectation on stats, no anything about that. My only goal this year was just to be available for 10 games. That's literally because I know if I'm available, I'm able to sky the limit for me. I can go out and make as much plays as I as I want to. So I wanna I, I just wanna continue to I just wanna continue to build and to continue to build. That's all I wanna do. And then we're gonna take this head on. We've got the XFL ratings, the poo-poo ratings, cratering ratings, the end of the world is here. We bring on Andrew Buckholtz of Awful Announcing. I wanted to get a sports reporter's thought. Not that I don't value the opinions of Twitter, but I wanted to get a sports reporter's thought. How is the XFL faring this season? Is this fine? I do think in general, TV executives and league executives are maybe higher on the audience for these alternative football leagues than the actual public is at this point. But that's the thing that can change. That's the thing that can change with time. And then Cody Main of Establish the Run joins us full XFL 2023 week six preview. Cody has just a genius brain when it comes to all of this fantasy, DFS, everything else. We're dying to get Cody's thoughts. And you know, from my perspective, if we can sit down, know the players that are playing each Saturday or Sunday or, or Thursday, as it may be in some cases, and can have a little bit of action on the game and a little bit of sweat equity, that's perfect. So ratings aside, everything else aside from, you know, fantasy and gambling perspective, it's been a really good product for us. And then who have prop bets for us speaking with a sitting senator on the podcast? Can you believe it? Canadian CFL football fans, you don't want to miss this. And even if you're American alt football fan, you do not want to miss this. Larry Smith, former commissioner of the CFL, now an inductee to the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. He was the one that oversaw the American expansion of the CFL back in the 90s. Sitting down with the senator, I really appreciate his time. You do not want to miss it. I told you it was a good one. Hope you enjoy it.
Hey guys, welcome to the Markcast. Reed here. The promo video you just listened to was probably already five minutes. I am tremendously excited for this episode today. If you could not tell, tweet it out. You know, all time. This is going to be, I think, an all time. Fan favorite with the guest list that we have assembled. Uh, that's the joy kind of I get from all this is like, you know, who can we get? Oh my God, we got Larry Smith. We got a senator on here. We got Stormy from ESPN, you know, Brandon and Jeff and everybody else. I really appreciate you guys all taking part in the journey with me. Uh, should be a good show this week. Uh, like I said off the top, Stormy uh, Bonatoni joining us from ESPN. I, I like getting, you know, I was telling Dorothy this the other day. I like talking to the ESPN people because, you know, like they're, they're doing the show and they're on the sidelines. And all that but i love you know unscripted 20 minutes like how the heck are you feeling about the season are we excited about this you know what what do you think of the quality and all that really appreciate stormy sitting down a uh, big special thanks to the houston roughnecks and the vegas vipers uh, you know jeff bedette i uh, was a pleasure uh, you know i never know getting players on if i haven't really interacted with them before i thought jeff was a delight really appreciate that and, and like i said uh, i have waited Three years to talk to Brandon Silvers on the podcast. Uh, longtime listeners know that you know back in the day they pushed back the season. We didn't have spring league or anything yet. Paul and I had nothing to talk about on here. Uh, we literally tasted Zoa flavors and talked about old episodes of The Bachelorette where there was a contestant, Jason Nick, that kind of looked like Brandon Silvers. I'll probably put the side by side up here somewhere in the episode. But, uh, you know, we we started the podcast. They pushed everything back. We didn't want to, you know, go away or do anything else. Pushing out episodes every week. And Brandon Silvers, unbeknownst to him, I think at the time, Really got us through some hard times. So really appreciate that. And then, of course, Andrew Buckholtz over at Awful Announcing. I appreciate just like the outside perspective. You know, we live in this XFL, USFL thing every day. Appreciate someone outside, you know, as a sports reporter. What do you make of all that? And then Cody Main, you know, just Brainiac, like I said, all those guys, the DFS, everyone over at Establish the Run. Really appreciate that. And then uh, Larry Smith, what do you know? We got a senator on the pod. Hi, definitely highest ranking official we've ever had on, uh, former CFL commissioner. And like I said, even if you're not a CFL fan, check out Larry's interview. He was the one that oversaw all the expansion back in the 90s, you know, the Baltimore Stallions and all of that. So yeah, check out Larry's interview. You're really going to want to hear what he has to say, his thoughts on you know, expansion nowadays, what this, the CFL be doing now. Larry knows Jim Pop, who's over at the USFL. See, we're all connected on here. So check out Larry's interview. Uh, banner is rolling. Don't forget, like and subscribe. We hit 3,500 subscribers. Two tickets to either the XFL or USFL championship game. I'm going to get the heck out of here. Please enjoy the interviews. I really, really, really hope you enjoy the show this week. I'll check back in at the end. Thanks. Well, we're continuing our trend here, bringing on our parade of ESPN on air talent. We have Stormy Bonatoni here. I was so worried I messed up the Stormy the first time. How are you doing, ma'am? No, that's perfect. I'm great. Honestly, like my name is a mouthful. So I'm very, very impressed that you took the time to find a video that had my name being said. There's so many vowels going on. So uh, I'm doing great, though. How are you? It's good. We're excited here. We're, you know, midway XFL. And we'll talk about lots of stuff today. You were coming off of the, you know, the, the, the loss, I guess the traumatic loss and, uh, you know, the battle dome with the, with the battle Hawks. And now we're getting ready for the Monday night football. How is the XFL treating you so far? How do you feel about everything? Dude, it's been a blast. And obviously, like, you know, following and covering the league the way you do, um, that it's for a reason. Like, it's actually interesting. And these games have been super fun. I keep telling my bosses I'm going to be so bored when we have to go back to regular college football and the standard way of broadcasting, because this has been so cool. If I have a question, even if it's not something where I'm going to go do a live interview with a player or coach, if I just have a question about anything, I'm watching the whole game from the bench area and I just go straight up. Up to the coordinator and ask, hey, um, you know, you're getting gashed in the run game right here. What can you do to fix it? And so it's it's just so unique. It's so cool. I love it for the viewer, especially getting to listen in on the officiating. I think that's a really, really unique part of, of what the XFL does. But it's been a blast. I, I absolutely love it. I feel like every time I leave a game, I go to the production truck to say goodbye to everybody who helped make who helps make the game go. And you cannot wipe the smile off my face because we're just we're having so much fun. And I'm very fortunate to have a really good crew for these games, too. 
when you got brought in, when they're like, hey, you're going to be part of this crew here coming up like, with, with thoughts. I mean, did you know 2020? Did we follow it? Like, what was your thought process? I had watched it from afar, like as a fan, just because it's unique and it's different. And I was very curious um, to know what it was all about. But now being a part of it is obviously such a different animal and such a different experience. And I think that under the new ownership that they have with Danny Garcia and Dwayne Johnson, they've done a really good job of like personally connecting with the players and branding and getting more people excited about the league that I truly like, I genuinely have a belief that this is the time, this is the iteration that the XFL is going to stick and that it's going to last. And that it's really going to be one of those more developmental leagues that I feel like the NFL is hungry for and wants. And so it would be awesome for that to be the case. And I genuinely get the sense from the coaches and players that are a part of it and everything that the league is doing that that's going to happen this time around. There's, you know, people are like in the XFL or the USFL, you get all these dissenters, but there's been a lot of, you know, obviously a DJ and everything, a player 54 and Danny, a lot of their branding. And I think for a lot of the XFL fans, oh, that's like he said that a million times, like we don't care. But when I watch like player 54 and I see Danny interacting with a lot of the players or, or the rock, it seems like they really buy that messaging. Is that your sentiment as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I get that if just because you've heard something before, it doesn't mean it's disingenuous, <laughs> you know, and that really is part of their story. And that's part of what's helped connect them individually with so many of these players, because he has been in those shoes and wanted to have a platform to be able to continue to grow and develop and reach that next level that he was never able to get to in the NFL. Granted, he's done just fine for himself. <laughs> but um, I think that it's very true. And when you talk to a lot of the players, or at least that I have throughout the course of the season, they genuinely feel a connection to ownership where I'm not sure that that's been the case in, in previous iterations. And they feel heard. They feel seen. They are so fortunate for every opportunity, like every week that I'm doing the one-on-one -on -one phone calls with these players. They're just over the moon appreciative to be talking to us, to be sharing their stories, to be having more eyeballs on them. It's been really cool. In terms of talent level, and obviously, you know, you're someone that you know, done a lot of college and moving through better, worse talent level than you expected here. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting because still, like, even though we're halfway through the season, we're still just like figuring out who teams are at this point. But in terms of the product, I've been really excited about it. And and I've also been like fortunate to be on a few good games um, that have been pretty back and forth and fun and exciting. And you get the ebbs and flows of a game, which has been cool. But I've really enjoyed the product. What I hope like... Uh, Ben DiNucci to stop turning the ball over. Think about how good Seattle could be right now. It's like, oh yeah, there you go with the Sea Dragons in the background. It's um, they've been fun. They're a team that um, part of my background is um as a betting host as well, and so that's been a big role in in my part of the broadcast for the XFL as well as talking about the betting portion of it. And from like going into week three, I've been telling everybody to buy in on Seattle futures because they were not as, as bad as they looked those first couple of games. The offensive output has been there week after week after week. Just the, the touchdowns and point production hadn't matched that with wins because of turnovers. And when you have a negative turnover differential, it's not going to be great. But they're so their defense has caught up there. They have so many weapons that like Seattle's a team I'm really excited about. And I hope they keep putting it together. Um, but the product in general, just to go back to your original question, it, it is better than I expected it to be. And you see how motivated these players are to make their mark and to get noticed and to work really hard. One of the top things I feel like we've heard from coaches over these first five weeks is that, you know, when you work in the NFL, a lot of the, the players can get a little bit complacent. Obviously there, there is something to being a pro and what it means to prepare like a pro. Um, but at times when you're at the top of your field and you, you know, you're great, you don't have to do quite as much, but all of these guys want to be there so bad that they're really giving it their all. They're putting everything into taking notes in every single meeting, doing extra reps, like all of those things are very, very real.
Yeah, speaking of Seattle, I want the player 54 with you know, Jim Haslett threatening to kill Ben DiNucci and Ben DiNucci wanting to bench Josh Gordon. I'm like, I mean, that's my team, but there's a lot of chaos on the sidelines right now. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, but that just makes it more fun. That's just, that's why it's the extreme football league. Like yeah. it's, it's, you know, you're supposed to get that that inside stuff um make it a little bit more fun make it make it more exciting i really like seattle though so hopefully everything can come together yeah we know we need that like a therapy session up here at lumen field um you know every, you but about- honestly every team's like that some of the sidelines i've been on i'm like you said what now <laughs> Well, that's the, and that's the thing nowadays. And like, I've heard that even with, you know, real, like, you know, in the NFL, whatever, like, you know, you can't hide anything on the sidelines if people are, you know, throwing stuff or being upset. And especially in the XFL, when you have microphones everywhere, like, uh, it does seem like you can't hide from the cameras. Yeah, there are so many cameras. That, I mean, you got sky cams at every game. There's handhelds in front of your face at every, every turn. Um, but it, it makes it more entertaining for sure. And it's fun. And everybody kisses and makes up after the games anyways, even in DC, St. Louis, that week three game uh, in Washington, DC, when there was the chippiness at the end of the game, all those guys still had to get a, on a plane together <laughs> afterwards. And they, they shook hands when all was said and done. So, um, you know, every, like I said, they kiss and make up, everything's fine. Uh, speaking of that, you know, we you were at the game last week of the St. Louis. Were you surprised that, you know, D.C. and I mean, it was close, but I mean, they, you know, came in and undefeated still. Yeah, D.C. is the real deal, I feel like. And it also just goes to show from a from an odds perspective how little we truly knew about these teams coming in, because both Houston and D.C. were among that like dark deeper in the basement echelon of teams in terms of odds. And now they're among the betting favorites and DC five and oh, um, they're rolling. They do something that no other team really does, which is actually run the football first and foremost, but also utilizing quarterback run um, with Jordan Tamu and Derek King. And I mean, obviously the performance we saw from Abram Smith from the running back position, that game was something pretty, pretty special, but they have it all. I feel like they're a very complete team when it comes to what they're able to do offensively that Greg Williams led defense while from a viewing perspective, you know, you can tell that there are some holes on that defense. Nobody's really been able to figure them out. And they're so good at disguising and shifting and blitzing and doing all the things um, that even five weeks into the season, nobody's really been able to figure out a best plan of attack and yeah you see that that game was close on the scoreboard and I think that there's something to St. Louis in the fourth quarter and being able to put some things together to rally but it it wasn't enough like that that game after the first quarter was never really in question whether or not DC was going to win it was just by how many and uh another win in cover for for the defenders and I've been fortunate we've had so many DC games um, it's been four, four of the five weeks, I think, whether it's home or away, we've covered them. So I feel very confident and we've got them again this week against Houston. So, yeah, it's going to be good. We'll, we'll preview the game here. Um, in terms of, you were talking about, you know, putting together, you know, the sports betting and getting, you know, getting, um, kind of research on the team spring football so hard. Cause like you come in, we got a couple week training camp. Like you said, we're week five, six. Now we're still discovering who these teams are. Then we go to the playoffs championship. It's over. Like how hard is it to really dive in and, and figure out kind of doing the job that you need to do in that short time frame? Well, and even like our stats are so limited, right? Because it's such a small sample size and you can't carry over anything from the 2020 iteration because all the players, coaches, um, teams are so different. So um, at the very beginning, it was definitely a bit of a challenge with the exception of some of those marquee names that everybody knew about um, and like being able to find stories and stuff. So the PR directors have been super helpful because um, prior to the league starting, you know, they were out there in Arlington getting to know some of these players, putting together little profiles for us so that as we got set to call a game and we're trying to pick out which players we want to talk to. We could kind of dig through the more intensive bios that they had pre-planned and put together for us, which was super helpful um, just to give us a little bit of a head start. Whereas, like you said, we there's not really a ton of Googleable information about a lot of these players because they hadn't played for the last couple of years. They've been working, you know, normal nine to five jobs, a lot of them. And, um, but that was honestly part of the fun of it 
is getting to, you know, when you watch college football and you watch Alabama, how many times throughout the course of the season are you hearing the same exact story? So we have the benefit of getting to present new faces and new stories and all of that every single week. Um, but yeah, credit the PR folks on, on all of these teams and helping us highlight what we need to highlight. In terms of you know you as an on air talent and do they just kind of give you free range you know do what you do and we trust you or how much direction do you get from the league and and the ESPN? So I was so scared because at first I had no idea what I was getting into. I've I have never and unless I get um, fortunate enough to be on the XFL again next year, I will never broadcast like this again. Right? It's a very very unique viewer and broadcasting experience and. We were originally supposed to do some rehearsals where like each one of us would get to do a half of football kind of a thing. But the weather in Arlington was so bad that they ended up getting canceled. The Texas ice storm, the great Texas ice storm, (laughs) the great Texas ice storm. Um, We even like flew into Arlington and didn't get to do what we wanted to do um, because of the weather. And we were all stressing, trying to figure out how to get flights out of there. And I ended up getting like the very last flight before the weather got super, super bad and all this stuff. Otherwise I would have been stuck in Arlington with nothing to do for like four days. <laughs> but, um, so we didn't get to practice. So that first game let me, t- I was so, so nervous and had no idea how it was going to go, but they were awesome. Basically we just, we hang out on the sideline with one of the PR people attached to our hip as we're going up and down the sideline the entire time. Anytime we want to talk to somebody on camera, we just let the PR person know, Hey, I want to talk to so-and-so they'll go tap them and say, Hey, you good. And then we go right up afterwards and talk to them. So it's like, it's a very quick, seamless process. There's not like much tape, if any, to go through because all of the players and coaches at this point, know what they've signed up for. So it's not a surprise when any of us go up to them. But like if the coaches, if like uh, Jim Hazlitt is in the heat of calling plays or something like that, we're going to back off. We're not going to intrude him in his space. But if we'll tap and be like, hey, Stormy's going to come chat with you in about like 30 seconds or after this next play or after this series, then he's mentally prepared for it. I'll come up, do what I'm going to do and go from there. Um, But it was all very much so a learning experience that first week. I was so scared and then it ended up being just really easy and fun. And it's some of the most fun broadcasting that I've ever done. These guys are so excited. It's so fun to be able to get that raw emotion coming off of a play. Um, Because we do all that research leading into the game, we know so many of these guys' backstories. So even in the heat of a quick play happening, we can reference something from their past or being a hometown kid or something special. And so um, bringing as much of that to light as we can has been great. It's interesting. We had AJ Smith on kind of during that week. Cause like, you know, that, I'm like, can we get some people on here? Like, you know, you guys are sitting and he was talking about how he used, cause he has his virtual training and he, he was using sitting in the hotel lobby, like running reps through everybody, you know, with Brandon Silver and whoever else utilized and all that. I just thought that was interesting use. And like only AJ was like, Oh, I've got stuff on my, you know, my virtual, whatever that they can work through. And uh, have you been impressed with, with AJ Smith and the Houston uh, offense? Yeah, absolutely. Which is why I'm bummed for him that last week they weren't able to have the showing that they wanted to have. Um, But hey, he when I interviewed him after Houston's win over Orlando the second time, um, he in the postgame interview said, June Jones, you're next. So maybe he got a little too big for the britches once like before going to play his mentor for a minute. We'll see if this past week was a little bit of a like, let's bring it back down to earth and level out. And now you're playing an undefeated team. We'll see how that goes. But I love AJ Smith. He's been great in our meetings. He is so open to sharing some of like those key words that we're looking for to explain to audiences on play calls. He is all about just like keeping that line of communication open and obviously airing the football out. Like he would love a football game where he didn't have to run it one single time. Just Brandon Silver's air it out, my man. Do what you need to do. Take what the defense gives you. Um, Very impressed with him though. And such a, a young offensive mind. And the lines of communication that he's had with Brandon and with some of those pieces on the offense and the headset, I think is really unique because You'll notice as you're watching the games, he'll talk to them like up to the time that the ball is snapped, still telling him what's happening on the back end where like I I would have thought that maybe you would 
for, I mean, we see it with most of the teams where the OC kind of like steps out of it for a second, lets them read what they're going to read because they don't want to be distraction. But Brandon wants that and that they have that communication. I think it's made the offense that much more effective. Well, I think they have that relationship where they've known. I think that, like, right. I don't, I don't know if June Jones could be sitting in there yelling at you know Ben DiNucci or whatever. Uh, it was like we were, we were at the Lumen Field game there, the you know the Roughnecks here against the Sea Dragons. We're the front row, fifty yard line. I said if we shut out Houston for the game, I might have to storm the field. So it's probably better for my, you know, my my livelihood that that didn't happen. But that was a very hot game there where we, I think it was scoreless through the third quarter. I mean, it was really uh, startling to see. Yeah, I mean, for a team that leads the league in passing touchdowns and scoring in general, for them to be held scoreless through three quarters was kind of wild. But also, like, leave it to them to make it a game in the fourth quarter still, when it had been off Seattle to that point, that with the way that the XFL point structure is, like, it's it's never over till it's over. I very firmly believe that. Uh, a couple of questions here. I'll let you go. I appreciate your time. Yeah. Um, you know, we're to, to talk real talk here for a minute and then we'll talk the game before we go. Uh, you know, ratings, not wonderful this week. We're going up against March Madness and it's a lot of like late FX games and stuff. Like, how do you feel momentum wise here? The season is going. I feel good. And I, I think that like the ratings that we got that first week were really, really good because the league had come back and um, it's it's this new toy and everybody wants to see what it is. The Super Bowl had just happened two weeks prior. So there's still that like feeling of we want football. Um, and I think that the product really did deliver that opening weekend. Like how fun were those games? And you had St. Louis with the comeback and executing the fourth and 15 and all of those things. And so that was really, really positive to get people to know, hey, the XFL is back. We exist. This is the kind of product you're going to get on a regular basis. Come tune in and enjoy it. And I think since then, it's still been pretty steady. And now with March Madness, I think it's just tough to compete with because every single person who's not even a sports fan is going to have their TV screens onto this. Every single bar is going to have it on um, March Madness right now. But I think as the games get less and less, the XFL numbers will start to rise again as well. Um, but I've been really pleased. Like people that that just that don't even like know me particularly well have reached out to just say how cool this league is. And I think that really says something about what it is that they're like, oh yeah, I saw you on an XFL game. Like you did? Okay, cool. Like keep it going. And being on FX, I think, has exposed us to an audience that otherwise might not be watching football as well. So I'm very pleased with everything and I just hope it continues to to grow and get some traction. Yeah, I, I went to Gonzaga. I was like, oh yeah, they're in the tournament. Like I'm so out of it. You're right so now. tunnel vision right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's all uh before I let you go, you know, previewing here, a big Monday night game. I'm excited. Uh you yeah, know, that's my quarterback, Brandon Silver, is back. You know, XFL 2020 was really excited to see him succeed. Uh, you know, we got Tayamu. Curious your thoughts on Tayamu as a quarterback, and then any other thoughts on the game before I let you go. Yeah, um, I like Jordan, and I still feel for him so much when you think back to the 2020 season because he was one of those guys that was really becoming a breakout star. It was like him and P.J. Walker. And everybody talks about Taylor Heineke as an XFL success story when Tom was started ahead of him with that St. Louis squad. So um, he's a great guy. I think that he's made steady improvement. It's been nice from early in the season where he wasn't really running the football to see him utilize that part of his game and to be dynamic, the duo that they have with he and Derek King. When he's had to throw the football, I feel like largely it's been good. They just haven't had to as much because they've been so efficient running the ball. Um, as far as the matchup goes, DC is a favorite in the game, which I think is like rightfully so, especially being at home in that environment that they have. It's a Monday night. So I'm curious, like how many people are going to show up compared to what they had on like a Saturday day game or a Saturday evening. But um, we know that they're passionate and they want to have their beer snake and they've even embraced the lemons. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes of this entire season was Michael Joseph saying when life gives you lemons, make a pick six. <laughs> so um, they've been really fun. Um, I, I just like am still trying to get a read fully on who Houston is, whereas I feel like I know what DC is. They have made their identity clear. 
And like I said earlier, most complete team right now, in my opinion, Houston, because of the relationships that AJ Smith and Brandon Silvers has had, had had and the players that they drafted that were very familiar with the system that they wanted to run in Houston. I think they had a little bit of a, like a head start. Whereas other teams were really just trying to gel and create chemistry and figure things out. They had already kind of had things figured out prior to week one. They also played a slightly weaker schedule. So now as you get into these tougher teams on your schedule, you're playing the best team in the league. You've maybe gotten brought down to earth a little bit after losing to Seattle. How do you respond to that? And what type of team are you really? So I think this is going to be a good prove it game for Houston. Uh, I'll tell you, Brandon, I talked to them today, very salty over the loss. So I think he's going to be coming in, uh, guns a-blazing. He's a Uh, character. (laughs) So you don't, I'm going to bore you with something you don't even care. So when the XFL existed in 2020, you know, went away, whatever. So then we do the podcast. Then when they push the league back, you know, they hey, we're going to go 2022, 2023. We had nothing to talk about on the podcast. So we, uh, my old co-host and I, uh, there was a character on one of the seasons of The Bachelorette that looked like Brandon Silvers. His name was Chase and Nick. I don't know if you've ever watched The Bachelorette. And we would literally do recaps of The Bachelorette talking about, Brand- like, this is how, I mean, now we're in, I'm in hog heaven because we went through about two years here where we had nothing to talk about. So Brandon Silvers is a longtime fan favorite of our podcast here. That's so funny. Like, that's really, really it's awesome. Really, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. He, you'll notice um, one of his, like, go-to cliche sayings, and it's it's cliche because it's true, right? Like, he's very take-what-the-defense-gives-me type of a quarterback and keep it simple. Um, so when I interviewed him post-game after the Orlando game, I was like, okay, take me through X, Y, Z, whatever, da, 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 da. And you can't say take what the defense gives. <laughs> It's me. So he's like, dang, you're making me think a little bit here. No, <laughs> those yeah. Everybody has those go-tos though. Like I have them as a broadcaster. We have them as people in day-to-day life. And so that's one of his, it's like his version of coach speak. No, it, it, he was that. And uh, he likes being in the system. Now he had a couple of them, but I thought it was good. I think he just wants to hang out in his pickup truck and play golf. It sounds like, I think he's, he's a, just that Alabama boy, you know? <laughs> yeah, he's good. Well, Stormy again, thank you. I really appreciate your time and balancing everything and coach calls and everything else. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate you. Have fun. Well, we now have, you know, in Seattle, we have the, the Ben DiNucci's of the world, but true XFL fans will know this man. We have Brandon Silvers here. Longtime listeners of the podcast will know this man is Chase and Nick. Brandon Silvers, how are you doing, sir? Doing pretty good. How are you? I'm good. I feel like we have lived a lifetime apart. We've never really spoken. I've watched you play in numerous spring leagues. Now you're back in the XFL. How is your life going right now? It's going good. Uh, it'd be a lot better if we were five and zero, but you know we're four and one. Um, you know, tough loss against you know your Seattle Sea Dragons. So uh, you know, just got to put that behind us and uh, keep moving forward. I know. So we were there. I might have tagged you in some. <laughs> I was very excited. Video stream. Uh, talk about that. I guess first off, what was it like returning to Lumen Field? Uh, I think it wasn't even Lumen Field last time that you know you played there. But what was it like coming back to Seattle? Yeah, I think it was called something else back then. But, I mean, literally it was almost three years to the day when we left, when I left to go back home because of COVID. So, you know, it's crazy. It's been a long but kind of quick three years, you know, during all the COVID pandemic and stuff like that. So, you know, it was a weird game, uh, maybe because it was, you know, a late game. But, you know, it was just we didn't click as offense at all, um, causing it to go our way. So, you know, it was just – it was good to be back, and I went by my old uh, apartment building and stuff like that. So uh, it was good to go back out there. No, it was cool. It was a homecoming, very different. What is, you know, and we, we had everything with Coach Zorn and, you know, uh, Mike Riley having to take time off. Uh, you know, a lot of ca- uh, chaos in 2020, even before everything happened in the world. What's XFL like now versus back in 2020? Well, my OC did not leave for, you know, reasons for <laughs> Good reasons for him. So I do have offensive coordinator. Um, I'm, I think I'm just in a better position, um, a, a system that fits my game. And, uh, you know, just me and OC that can see eye to eye and, you know, just play football. You know, it's the same type of offense I was in in college. So, 
you know, I'm in a, for me personally, I'm in a better position now than I was back in 2020. Um, you know, especially when Mike Riley left, um, for his, his reason. So, you know, I'm just, you know, trying to take advantage of this opportunity and, uh, you know, win some games. Uh, talk about, uh, we've had AJ Smith on before as well. Talk about, you know, coach Smith and what is it like? It just a, a genius. It seems like kind of, you know, behind the football. What has it been like under him? Yeah, I mean, you definitely listen to him on TV. You know, he's he's in our mind and also the receivers' ears. You know, the whole almost the, every play for the most part. So, you know, it's been fun. Luckily, me and him see eye to eye. So, you know, he, he does switch some plays. You know, late in the um, in the clock. So, um, I'll have to say something to him every now and then. But you know, it's it's great. It's great for him to call out what the you know probably what the coverage is looking like and what the receivers should do because all our routes post-snap routes they're all option type routes and to do that and you know he just helps out with all of us and making it easier for us yeah we've heard it's almost like and we've had our you know the xfl writers on it almost seems like a cheat code where he is in like able to talk with the wide receivers and tell them kind of the route or where how they need to be looking out uh, do you think other you know ocs and coaches are going to kind of pick up on this either this year or next year because it does seem like it gives you guys a good advantage yeah, it gives us a good advantage just from, like I said, switching plays. But, um, you know, just getting us in the right opportunity, you know, right situation. Um, and he does a great job at that. Um, so, you know, I mean, every every team can do that. It's not just like our team. You know, every every team has the same amount of mics in our helmets and stuff like that. So, you know, if they can do it, you know, why don't they, you know, they can, you know, why won't they do it? You know, so. You know, just because our OC does a lot more than the others, I mean, that's that's on them. That's not our fault. Uh, getting brought back in, you know, to this round of the XFL, there was we had on uh, John Vogel on the show, one of the draft guys, and uh, audible gasp from us when you walked out on stage. It was kind of like the Royal Rumble, right? Like, okay, we're we're bringing out all these people. What was it like getting the call, getting to come back and be a part of this? The XFL. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I the last two years I've. I went and did the spring league with AJ Smith um, the year after the XFL. So, you know, it was really, I knew I was going to be with him. You know, I passed up some USFL, you know, backup and, and CFL jobs. So um, I, I really wanted to be in the system because, you know, I didn't play well in Seattle. You know, I didn't have a good, you know, showing out there. So I really just wanted to, even if it cost me a little bit, I wanted to be in this situation with him. And him as my OC, so I, you know, cut down a lot of, couple opportunities. But you know, now I'm thankful, and you know, I'm in the best opportunity I've been in in my pro career. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, and I, you know, I've heard different stories. How come you never wound up in the USFL? Was that a personal decision? Well, they they called um, the the VP called said they sent me a contract, and I thought about it, um, but I wanted to be with one team just because that fits my needs I didn't want to get thrown in a situation where it's not it doesn't fit my game so you know Daryl Johnson called me we were talking to him and they said I wasn't one of their top quarterbacks so I was like well all right I don't know if I'm gonna play then because I know I was AJ's top quarterback so um you know they called and you know had some discussion I think I ended up signing the contract um at, at the night before the draft and you know couple of teams called actually called AJ to try to draft me and they said I you know that I wasn't on the list so you know some weird stuff that happened you know they said that wasn't the case but you know I just it's it's whatever and I move forward yeah uh, so now you're you know in AJ's system and we've talked about this where it seems you know we bring in Cole McDonald for a little bit we have you what is it about this scheme everything now that fits you that because uh you know and I watched you in 2020 but this is a far better showing than we had you know back in Seattle in uh, February you know a couple years ago yeah yeah for sure and I was just like I said you know it, it, the, the showing in 2020 it was it was hard on all of us it was, you know, it's hard on Coach Zorn. You know, when an OC comes in and brings his own plays, his own system, then he leaves for, you know, personal reasons, which is, you know, he had to do what he had to do. Like, it was hard on Coach Zorn as well, as long as all of us do, because that wasn't his system. So it was just a, you know, it was just a bad deal. It happens. But, you know, I feel like me, we're both air raid backgrounds. AJ has a run and shoot background. So we're doing a bunch of that stuff that I did in spring league and then mixing in a couple air raid stuff, which I did at 
Troy. So, you know, we, we just get each other. I mean, this has been like a two year deal that I've been talking with him. Um, so, you know, just finally coming together and uh, I ended up winning the starting job, obviously. So, you know, I, I still had to win it. It wasn't like I was given nothing. So, um, you know, and, and just enjoying it, enjoying every day as well. Uh, you talk about the spring league and we watched you there and they, with the conquerors, which I know, I, I think listener Harrison would say it's probably the best branding of any uh, alt football league here. I would say the jousters. I'm, I'm, I'm a little more prone to the jousters, but uh, what was it like in the spring league with AJ? And uh, I remember I was sitting out on my deck and you coming out at you know, mid game. I think Kevin Anderson was the other quarterback and just going ballistic throwing balls down the field. Uh, what was that whole experience like? It, it was definitely weird, but it was like, well, that was like the only thing I could go do at that time. And AJ called me like a week and a half beforehand about that league. And I was like, oh, I'm not doing nothing. Might, might as well, you know, go do it. Because I obviously I watched the Houston team in the XFL, and they had a great offense. So I was like, well, this is my opportunity to play football again. I'm going to go do this. So um, it was different. I mean, it was so chill, laid back. I mean, we didn't have workouts. Like we just go and practice for an hour and a half on the half the field at the other team. And then we would go to – I was in Indianapolis, so we would go to the Jim Mercer Rec Center and just go play basketball. I would go play basketball, a little workout, sauna. Like, we, it was just kind of like you got your practice over with in the morning and, like, you had the whole afternoon just to hang out. And we had a great group of guys, too. So, you know, it was fun. It was fun being around Indy that whole time. Uh, hub format now. Are we liking the travel? We heard Danucci kind of talking about it. It's hard. I mean, it's the pro of getting in. You're getting in the stands and getting people. What are your thoughts on the travel? Yeah, and I talked to Ben every week, so he's, he's a good buddy of mine. Uh, just and then we just got close over the Palmer workouts, and then you know, obviously we're in the same system. Uh, I mean, I rather, especially them. They have the worst. I don't. We don't really have it that bad, you know, but. The night games with the bus travel, yeah, that's that's no fun. Um, I'd rather be in Houston. Obviously, I have family there. And then, you know, just staying, staying in Houston, you know, I'd much rather be there. So, yeah, our, our travel is not too bad. I mean, we have seven games in Texas. Uh, we're about to finish our last flight of the season. So, we don't have it as bad as those, you know, the North teams, I guess. So, but, yeah, it honestly, it, it sucks. I'll just say that. Uh, uh, Coach Palmer going through all of that. And we, I remember when the Instagram videos came out, we we're like seeing, you know, trying to piece together. We had people, uh, what was it like kind of going through that whole experience? It was, it was really fun. Um, you know, George, chill dude, you know, out Southern Cal, you know, had a nice little uh, golf simulator that we hit golf balls and play golf a little bit uh, with some other quarterbacks. So, you know, that whole deal was fun just flying out there and hanging out. So, um, yeah, he's, he's a great guy. You know, um, I obviously have another quarterback turn I use in Mobile. So, but any, any time you can get with another quarterback turn, you just try to piece together anything you can just to, you know, make yourself improve. I'm curious for you, you know, coming back here now, you know, it's three years removed and where do you view your place? And like, what is, what is Brandon Silver's next goal here? I think, for me, it was just getting back. Obviously, I had a bad taste in my mouth leaving Seattle. You know, didn't win. You know, didn't play very well. So, you know, with all that stuff that happened, you know, I just wanted to get back playing football the way I knew I could and being in a system that fits me and not just some random, random, you know, deal. So, for me right now, it's just playing in this system and having fun with the guys and, you know, scoring a ton of points, which we are right now. And then winning games, I know that for me, that's just my goal. You know, my goal was just win games and play good football. And, you know, we'll see what happens next. But like that was for me, like I had to wait a long time to get in this opportunity for the last three years um, to, you know, have, you know, get people's respect back, I guess I could say. Well, it seems like, you know, we've had, you know, like Pat Rafino on the show here this week talking, you know, like some people we watch like Kyle Sloter, we're watching even your friend here, Danucci and, you know, they're really like, this is their one thing and they got it. They're pushing and, and just, it feels like they're, they're trying really hard and it feels like you're just at a place where you're more comfortable and just who you are. I don't know if that makes sense. And just like you're with AJ now you're here and it's more about having fun and, and just winning than it is trying to like get the next big contract or whatever. 
Yeah, and I, like I said, like I'm, I'm just focused on playing good football, and I, you know that will that will take care of itself. But you know, just getting back to having fun and playing in a real league, and at some other little little league, you know, like the, the spring league and stuff like that. Like I wanted to be back in this XFL because I knew this is where the most eyes were going to be on, I believe, and um, obviously besides the NFL. So you know, just getting back to having fun and playing the game. You know, and you know, I didn't have, I didn't. Personally, I didn't have fun out in Seattle, um, and I didn't, you know, spring league was spring league, and so, you know, I'm just getting back to having fun, like, this is the most fun I've had since my Troy days, so, you know, I'm just enjoying every minute of it. A uh, couple questions, Charlotte. I'll let you go. I appreciate your time. Uh, you know, uh, we saw unseated, you know, here are two different franchises unseated by the Sea Dragons. Uh, what was it, you know, coming out, you know, we were, I think it was shut out in the first half and then you guys had the late, you know, the late surge and did the fourth and 15. What was it about Seattle's defense or what, like you said, was it the late game? What was it that, that made you guys a little bit of a struggle? Uh, it was just, you know, we just didn't have, we weren't, we just weren't clicking. You know, we had a, a draw play for a touchdown, got called back for holding. Um, and then, you know, I had the strip sack that I was oh, I, about to be a touchdown, I believe, um, on one of our plays. Um, so it just like every, everything that went wrong kind of went wrong. Um, you know, a couple holds here and there, but like that's just football. Um, so, it just didn't click, and then we played so badly, and then we had a chance to win the game at the end of the game. And so with all that said, with all what happened, you know, in the first, you know, 58 minutes, like we still had a chance to win the game at the end of the game. So, you know, it was a weird game. Um, it was just kind of like, you know, John Trey obviously went out. He's out for the season, which, you know, hurts. But, you know, just got to have someone else step up. So, you know, just – you know, just got to play ball. You know, it was just kind of like a weird game, and I can't really get my head around it. Maybe it's because it was a late game. Maybe it's going back to Seattle. But it was just, you know, just a weird game and all. Uh, yeah, uh, John Trey out, you know, we saw the news this week. How how big of a of a hole is that now for the offense? Yeah, you know, John Trey's a big part of our offense. You know, he's, you know, he's a go-getter. You know, just throw it up to him. He's going to go get it. I believe, I believe. The play he got hurt on, I thought that was a catch. That's another thing. But, you know, just got to put it anywhere around him, and he was going to go get it. And, you know, just sad to see. And it's going to be out six months. So, um, but, you know, we'll have other guys step up. You know, they got to. There's no choice. Um, you know, just keep rotating guys in and, you know, let them let them get their opportunities. I'll, my job is to get them the ball and, you know, see what they can do. Uh, big game here Monday night, right at DC. Uh, another strong defense, I and mean, we've seen them. The only other undefeated. What are you? I mean, to me, it's the biggest game of the weekend by you know by a long shot. What do you make of the the big Monday game? Yeah, uh, it's Monday night. I know it's on ESPN two, so that that'll be good for us. Um, you know, obviously they're five and zero, beating uh, St. Louis twice. Um, so, you know, they're they're a good football team, but you know, we just gotta play our game and do us and you know it'll take care of itself uh well brandon i really appreciate it long time listeners know we filled after the 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 covid and everything went away we spent a long time of our show actually there's a, a reality tv contestant that looked like you on the bachelor and his name was jason nick wasn't quite as handsome but we filled a lot of time and kind of that off time when we didn't know what was going on <laughs> recapping episodes of the bachelor as if you were a contestant of the show so i appreciate you getting us through the doldrums of uh, spring football yeah, yeah, I, I saw like uh, I saw a notification or something. Like someone sent it to me. I was like, no, I'm not no bachelor. I actually mess mess with people who kind of watch that show. So like my girl, I talked to she uh, she watches it with her girlfriend. So I I was like, yeah, I don't I don't want to get into it, but that show is just funny. No, it's good. I appreciate it. I think you have a future in some sort of, you know, it doesn't need to be dating, but some sort of reality TV show. I could see you here coming up. Uh, you know, you want to take a break from football or anything else? Yeah, I mean, I could, you know, it's just all up in there now. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens after, you know, maybe we'll see Seattle in the championship game. Maybe, maybe, maybe you'll be down in San Antonio. Uh, well, no, I yeah, I have my flights booked. We'll be there. I hope to see. I think we'll see. I, I mean, I think it's fair to say. I think Houston will at least be contending. We'll see you there. I appreciate it, Brandon. Like I said, it's been a long time coming. Three years of watching you. And I still have here uh, somewhere signed your XFL 2020 shirt back there. So I don't know if you can see that. But it's always, always part of the show.
Yeah, for sure. For sure. I appreciate it. Awesome. Brandon Silvers, uh, Chase and Nick here uh, on the podcast. Really appreciate your time and good luck. Uh, yeah, I don't care about DC at all. So good luck this weekend. Yeah, I uh, appreciate it. Thanks. Well, coming off of a, a monster game and getting a win and Vipers and everything else, you have Jeff Fidette here. How are you doing, sir? Man, I'm doing great, man. Blessed to uh, be able to sit here and talk with you, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate it. We're halfway through. We've you know, made it past week five here, and we'll talk about kind of XFL 2020, your time as well. But how is everything feeling for you right now? Man, it's, it's kind of, uh, when I sit back and think about it, it kind of gets me emotional, man, because of uh, all the things I've been through. And now I'm finally getting uh, recognized for my talent that I know I always had um, and just being available, you know what I'm saying? So still trying to suck it all in, but be still be uh, prepared because I'm not not done yet. You know what I'm saying? We only have it through the season. Man. I'm just looking forward to just continuing to get better. Uh, what do you, you attribute that to? Not not getting the right looks or not being in the right circumstances? I mean, wh- what? H- how do you feel like you've gotten to this position you're at right now? Yeah, man, like you said, um, uh, like my NFL career, you know what I'm saying, being an undrafted guy. So, you know, that's, that, that's tough anyways because you're in a room full of millionaires. So, you know, that's tough anyways. And then uh, like you said, being not being in the right position, not being able to uh, showcase my talent, not having the opportunity that I felt like I needed. And and on top of that, the icing on the cake has just been injuries. You know what I'm saying? been dealing with injuries these past two years. So I think my main thing is just what, what keeps me going and like gets me happy that I'm that I'm available. You know what I'm saying? That jump that is available to play. So I think those are, those are really like how my career has been so far. Uh, this season, not off to the ideal start. Got a big win here uh, last. It uh, was that sa- uh, sa- uh, Sunday night, Saturday. Saturday. It all kind of yes, got, the weekend kind of blurs together. Right. Uh, last weekend uh, against Orlando, what was that like for you guys to finally get the W? Man, it was it was such a a, a great feeling. You know what I'm saying? Going into the locker room and seeing the smiles on everybody's faces. It was just something that we want to continue to see after a game. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it was just something that we are uh, can build on, you know what I'm saying? All the losses we took, it wasn't really lost. It was a lesson learned, you know what I'm saying, looking at what we can get better at. So um, we're just looking forward to just keep, like, try, just trying to stream wins together, you know what I'm saying, just trying to go one and zero each and every week. So I think that's what we've, our focus has been on. It was cool to me, you know, and I turned on the game and I saw Luis Prez there and he's been on the show before. And, you know, he's been around like you've been around, the, you know, all these leagues and challenges. And here's someone that's, you know, all the way through and USFL like you did. And, you know, part of the spring league, Luis Prez was and everything else. How cool is it that you guys are both kind of here together now, you know, really accomplishing stuff together? Yeah, it's funny you said that, man. I've been trying to uh, be on the same team with Luis in 2018. Uh we were training together out in Fort Lauderdale when we was coming out in our drive class. Um, I know what type of QB he was, you know what I'm saying, working out with him for the longer time. And me and him uh, staying in contact over the years and just pretty much just dreaming like, yo, man, I wish I could be the same team. So I'll do this. I'll throw you this ball. I'll do this and that. And seeing that seeing that together and seeing it that like we actually like spoken into existence, man, it's just like kind of crazy to me when I look back at it, you know what I'm saying? So it was no question that I know it was going to be clicking once I found out we was on the same team together. Uh, what's he, what's he like? And he, like I said, he's been on the show, but what, what do you, what do you make of Louise? I mean, he's, I, I called him the spring league Forrest Gump. I meant that in a yes. good way. Like, cause he's yes. just been a part of everything. Uh, what is it like uh, spending time with him? It's funny you said that, man. Cause Forrest Gump is my favorite movie of all time. And that's literally who Louise is. <laughs> Louise is a free football Forrest Gump. Nah, but Louise is a guy that, man, he's so passionate. He, you can say he loves the game. Uh, he can be a bit annoying sometimes or how much he can talk about stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's a good thing, though, Louise. I love you. But um, he's a guy that so 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 many times he's seen the hallway like, yo, man, uh, Jeff, I'm thinking about this. Or, yo, man, what do you got to think about this? So he's just a guy that just loves the game, man. And he's one guy that I know, like, going into a game, he will always be prepared. That's one guy to not have to worry about because he prepares, he works hard, and he's just a genuine guy. Uh, that's what we said, you know, no matter what team he's on, you know, he's going to get on the field, you know, no matter kind of who, you know, who's the starter, what's going on, everything else. Uh, you know, you had a huge game here, you know, two TDs, you know, five receptions, 80 yards. Like, uh, how, how did it feel? It felt like you guys were finally clicking. I think it was the highest scoring game of the season thus far, you know, both sides and they talk all those over and unders and everything. I don't understand, but what was it like, you know, really kind of feeling like you guys were clicking? Yeah, man. On a, uh, on a personal tip, um, Orlando was a team that I had circled on the schedule because um, 
Orlando is my hometown. You know what I'm saying? I'm from Orlando. Uh, Orlando was the only XFL team I was communicating with the whole process. Uh, did a couple of workouts with them. Was was thinking that was a team I was going to get to, but things ended up happening and I didn't. So it was kind of like a game to where, like, you know what I'm saying? I had to, like, prove to them, like, what y'all kind of was missing out on. Y'all missed out on the hometown guy. But um, as far as, like, the team-wise, like I said, well, me and Louise clicking and stuff like that, um, like I said, I just knew that, like, that time was coming because, like I said, me and Louise – been knowing each other, we uh click and practice. We make those same plays in practice, so if we don't make them in practice. We won't make them in the game. So he's just a guy that, like I said, we uh when we out on that practice field, we take we take it very serious because we know like that stuff translates. And just seeing that it did translate translate that night was just a beautiful thing to see. I don't know if you've been paying attention. I think you're probably better off not on Orlando right now. <laughs> oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt, without a doubt, without a doubt. Without a doubt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of, you know, we talked to Rod Woodson, you know, coach Woodson here preseason when we went down to Arizona during the showcases. And I mean, really struck me. I'm not someone that speaks with a lot of NFL head, you know, or football head coaches, but like struck me as kind of the leader that he seemed to be when I, you know, interviewed him along with the others down there. Uh, what is he like? And, and what is kind of, you know, the message you get from the coaching staff on your team? Man, Coach Wilson is uh, a very passionate guy. Like, it's almost – Coach Wilson sometimes tap into his player, Coach Wilson. Like, sometimes he leaves the coach and goes into his player, Coach Wilson, to where, like, he's very passionate, man. I, and I, I, just love, I, I just love seeing that. Like, Coach Wilson just a guy that, like, I, I truly value his opinion about me because, like I said, he's a Hall of Famer. He's been around a lot of great guys. So, just hearing him speak to us, you know what I'm saying, my eyes are, my eyes are wide, my ears are open, like, because – he just be dropping so many gems, you know what I'm saying? Cause like he's been playing the game for so long at the highest, at the highest level. And um, speaking for my receiver coach, Coach Sermon, who's a guy that been coaching over 40 years in the NFL, he coached the top receivers in the league, like receiver like Jerry Rice, Randy Moss, Terrell Owens, just to name a few, like just to name the top guys. So just to have him and uh, to pick his brain out, like I said, we got, uh, I want to say we got like 278 years of coaching the screen, which is kind of crazy to say. You know what I'm saying? So it's just, it just truly just having a, uh, a blessing to have the coach because as a player, I've been playing this game for a while, so I know what players need because it's so mentally and physically on you. So you need, like, coaches that are transparent and players' coaches. And our coaching staff is just a beautiful example of that because they're, they're so transparent and, they, and, they, and they're and they player coaches. So they, they try to look out for us as, as much as possible. So it's a true blessing. How did he – how did he keep you guys and the rest of the coaching staff, how did they keep you guys, you know, Terrible first four weeks, right? I mean, I know that there was bad luck, and I've watched all the games. You know, you see teams, I don't want to call <clears throat> Orlando out, but, you know, you see some teams, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe, you know, there's a little bit more chaos there. You guys, you know, Woodson, we, we saw him, you know, halftime, at, I think it was Audi Field, you know, getting into it with the referees. Yeah, but otherwise, yeah, crazy. But, it, you know, yeah. it has kept you guys motivated in the games. How, how do they do that? Yeah, so uh, man, if you if you actually go back and look at all our game, we literally been in every game we played in. Like the Arlington game, literally was winning all the game, and then we had those crazy uh, turnovers. You know, what I'm saying the DC game, we was leading at halftime, tied up at the end of the third quarter, and then the fourth quarter we ended up like you know, what I'm saying doing something crazy. Then the Seattle game, we literally was winning the whole game until the last thirty seconds of the game with Josh Gordon made that crazy play. So all our games, we literally been in the game. So that's why I say like with all our losses. Really wasn't lost. It was, they looked like losses, of course, like on our record board, but it was more like lesson learned. Like, what did we learn about these games? You know what I'm saying? So, so that's how Coach Wilson kind of keep us, like, you know what I'm saying, motivated. You know what I'm saying? Just uh, us, like, really seeing that, like, man, we've been in most of the games. You know what I'm saying? We, if we can stop, like, shooting ourselves in the foot, you know what I'm saying, and actually playing mistake free football, then we can, we have a good chance of going on the run. So, that's pretty much all I like. Well, well, I can say on that because, like I said, it's, it's just all lessons learned, and we know that like we can play mistake-free football in the sky limits for us. Yeah, I uh, was at Arlington for the kickoff, and I'm you know I'm the Luis Perez guy, and I remember that you know I was I think I was in that corner where it's like the outfield, whatever. When they threw, the, we had the pick, and I'm like, oh my god! Like, oh, Luis. see, yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> And they don't feel bad for that. Uh, in terms of, you know, now moving forward, you know, we've got the one under our belt. How do you guys, you, how do you feel poised here? You got St. Louis coming into Cashman Field this weekend. Yeah, man, we train this as a, a, a must win. You know what I'm saying? We already, uh, in our division, we're already down two from D.C. and took one from Seattle. So we, we really can't afford any more losses in our division. And uh, we're going against a really good St. Louis team. Because what's to talk about them today, how, 
uh, that's a team that finds a way to stay in the game. Every game they play in, they find a way to stay in the game. You know what I'm saying? They play mistake-free football. You know what I'm saying? AJ McCarron is uh, taking care of the ball. They got a very good running back. You know what I'm saying? Good receivers. And then on the defensive end, those guys are flying to the ball. So we do have a good challenge on us. But like I said, we, we've been, uh, been been preparing this week. You know what I'm saying? Going hard at practice and just looking, just looking forward to the opportunity to be, uh, to play this game. Uh, in terms of, you know, you were part of the XFL back in 2020 with, you know, the Renegades, uh, differences, what, what's it like now versus back then? Yeah. Uh, as far as team or as far as in the XFL in the whole? Yeah. Just your experiences. Uh, yeah. So XFL, man, the first time XFL, like I said, going back to, uh, my career personally about like having opportunities and all that stuff, you know, Renegades, um, we was hoping Landry Jones would be our quarterback, but he battled with so many injuries. So we was like bouncing around too many QBs to where like I couldn't really find a groove in that. So that that first time around, like as far as like the expert as a whole, it was real fun, you know what I'm saying? Being able to a lot for them allowing us to express ourselves and get an opportunity to play the game. But on a personal tip, I feel like I ain't really ball how I wanted to. Um this time around, uh it's different on the sense of like it's a bubble now, you know, all teams are staying in Dallas and uh as far as games, you know, the same teams are flying on the same plane together. So that was kind of like awkward, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, you know what I'm saying? You go and like you lose the game and you get a team that's like turned up in the back of the plane and you got the losing team in front that's all quiet and stuff. So that's the one thing that was kind of like awkward about it. So I think that was like the main difference. But, cause, but as far as like play, the same thing, like all the same rules, everything's the same, you know what I'm saying? There's, uh the uh the mics on the field, you know what I'm saying? Everybody might all the skilled players are mic'd up and uh like I said, a special team rule. So those two are the same. Just the difference is like the bubble and like the teams flying together. I, I could only imagine Danucci there after that Seattle Vegas win and just how loud he was cheering on oh, the field. Man. <laughs> hey, I would say this though. I would say this a team that gets lit after the win is DC. Oh, they be acting a fool. <laughs> DC, they be acting a fool after a win. <laughs> well, I mean, they are undefeated right now. Right, know? right. Hey, hey I, hey, I don't got nothing to say about it. Hey, turn up. If it was me, I'd be doing the same thing. So, y'all, hey, they deserve it. 5 and 0, they deserve it. Uh, a couple last ones for me. I'll let you go here. In terms of you know talent level, twenty twenty to now, you know, a lot of work and the scoutings, and we're bringing in you know, all these different types of head coaches. And we're doing all these showcases, everything. How do you feel the talent level is now? Yeah, so I would say this time around, there's more big time name players. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have the A.J. McCarrens, the Vic Beasleys, the Josh Gordons, you know what I'm saying? The Martavius Bryants in this league, I mean, the 2020 league. So I think this league right here, I've, as far as like name guys that did, that made a name for himself in college and NFL, I think that that was the difference. But um, also, too, it's a lot of guys in the league that can, without a doubt, play at the next level. You know what I'm saying? I feel like I'm one of the guys, without a doubt, like, uh, I think my my confidence level is like through the roof. You know what I'm saying? I've been playing this game for so long to where like, uh, no offense to anybody, I don't see anybody who lines up in front of me. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm picking me every single time. You know what I'm saying? Because I know the work that I put in, and my confidence level is like super super high. So as far as skills, it's a lot of guys in this league that can play at the next level without a doubt. You talked about the hub and everything. Obviously, you're part of the USFL and the you know, the, the bubble there. Not bubble, but you have whatever they call it, the hub stuff. Uh, experiences like compared to this versus back in Birmingham. Ah, man, I'm uh, man. I I don't I don't really have too much good things to say about the USFL the first oh. time. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't want to I don't want to turn into a big big thing. But no, USFL, no. I, I got to I got to a very I got to a very very dark place in my life playing in the USFL. So. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like that experience. Not one bit. You know what I'm saying? I went through a lot of stuff during my time, my short time there, you know what I'm saying? Dealing with an injury and having a couple of people lie, lie to me and stuff like that about my injury. You know what I'm saying? It was only caring about guys being available and stuff like that. So yeah, I didn't, I don't really got too much good things to say about the USFL. I'm not going to lie about that. That's okay. I'm I'm known online as a big USFL hater. So no, I'm kidding. Yeah, but no, I, mean, I understand. I understand. <laughs> yeah, You're I didn't here like now. It, not one bit. I, Coming off of such a game last week, how do you, you know, kind of here before I let you go, how do you look to build on that or, you know, maintain the momentum, everything else? Like, what are you looking forward to here the the second half of the season? Yeah, man, I want to, uh, I just want to see where this takes me, you know what I'm saying? I want to, I'm, I'm a guy that's starving, man. I'm like, I, I just feel like I got so much catching up to do because this is something that I've been wanting to do for, for the longest time, but it was never my time. It was all God's timing. So it ended up being the, the, the perfect time to do it. So, I just want to. I, I I just want to 
my main thing is just being available and just continuing to get better. That's all I wanted. That, that, that's literally all I care about. Like going into the season, I had no uh, expectation on stats, no anything about that. My only goal this year was just to be available for 10 games. That's literally because I know if I'm available, I'm able to sky the limit for me. I can go out and make as much plays as I, as I want to. So I want to, I, I just want to continue to, I just want to continue to build and just continue to build. That's all I want to do. Well, Jeff, I'll be rooting for you. I, I couldn't care less about the Battle Hawks. I'm not one of those caca guys, so you're fine. I, mean, <laughs> I, I ride with the Dragons, but this weekend here we'll get you St. Louis and everything else. Really appreciate your time. I know it's crazy with practices and everything else. Really means a lot for you coming on the show, so thank you. No, nah, man, thank thank you, man. I appreciate you allowing to come up here and, uh, you know what I'm saying, just, just showing love, man. I really appreciate it. Well, we'll rock and roll here, and good luck the second half of the season. And yeah, tell tell my boy Luis hi. He's a good guy. I like him. Yeah, that's my that's my guy. I'm, I'm about to see Luis in about ten minutes, man. I'm about to uh, I'm about to holler at him. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. All right, man. Thank you. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Well, I'm excited today. We have Andrew Buckles here, one of the writers over at Awful Announcing. We're having, you know, if you're an XFL fan, maybe an awful week with all the different ratings and everything else. You know, there's panic and, te- and contextualizing and all that. I figured I would bring in an expert that you know covers sports business. I just I like getting outside perspectives because we live in this every day about kind of where the XFL's at, ratings, everything else. Andrew, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Perfect. Uh, so first off, just if people don't know who you are, uh, who are you? What do you kind of work on outside of coming on the XFL podcast here? Yeah. So um, my main job at the moment is a news editor for Awful Announcing. Uh, I've been working there, uh, which is a sports media site. It grew out of initially just like criticizing the announcers, but it's now like fully sports business, all sorts of uh, all sorts of sports business stuff, rating, uh, ratings, deals, um, interviews, all that sort of stuff. I've been working there since 2012, um, more and more full-time over the last few years. And the other thing that may be relevant to alternative uh, fans of alternative football is that I did used to run uh, the Yahoo blog covering the Canadian Football League for from uh, 2010 to 2017. So I've got a lot of experience in the alternative football world. Well, that's good. I just wrapped uh, with the CFL Hall of Fame inductee Larry Smith here, one of the commissioners yes. over there. So yeah, yeah. yeah well, very important well, figure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, good. So Andrew, we're here. We're talking all of this. I see my landscapers pulling up outside, so I might have to close the window here if the nose gets too bad um here we are we're the midway point we're further than we've ever made with the xfl back in 2020 approaching week six we're going up against march madness that was always kind of the concern back in 2020 what everything was going to look like how do you feel like the xfl is going thus far here in 2023 version 3.0 yeah i mean I think with all of this, it's with any sort of these ratings, it all depends on your perspective and it depends on what you're comparing it to. I think the big thing um, with these current ones is, as you mentioned, that they're going up against March Madness. So getting getting 320,000 fans as a high is not great. Getting uh, in the 200,000 uh, average viewership for the other three games is really not great. But there's the context of what you're going up against. And I, I think the XFL and any sort of U.S. alternative football league is interesting in that so much of it is about is this a viable TV product versus does this work in terms of selling tickets in the stands. Uh, a, a lot of it is about trying to make content for these sports networks during a period where they may or may not have a whole lot else going on. Um these numbers aren't great. They're below what we've seen in the past, certainly, but uh, all of that comes with some caveats because a lot of these alternative leagues have had very weird distribution uh, um, agreements from like CBS Sports Network to like Bleacher Report Live, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these, the ones this weekend in particular, they're all on cable. That's a thing to keep in mind. A couple of them are on FX, which does not usually have sports content. That's a thing to keep in mind. I think it, my overall takeaway would be this isn't great for the XFL. It's probably below what they would have been expecting for this reboot at this point. But it's also not necessarily let's blow it all up. Uh, yeah. So, you know, and I I get kind of whatever you want to believe is your favorite league online. I kind of get criticized. What You know, I'm the big USFL sure. hater. I'm the big XFL hater. You know, 
there's nobody in the world that does this podcast every week talking about this, the, you know, these things that uh, wants this to be bad, right? I want this to be good. Same with the USFL. I want all this. But yeah, when I see, you know, quarter of a million people, mm -hmm. you know, these games are not at phenomenal times, right? Uh, the one on mm -hmm. Thursday night here, we see the 256, uh, you know, Houston at Seattle. That was a six o'clock kickoff in Pacific, you know, nine o'clock kickoff. <laughs> Uh, you know, up against the behemoth of March Madness, would these would these ratings even be bad if they were on like ABC or ESPN uh, Prime? Well, I, I think that I mean, I think that really is the big thing of like if these were ABC ratings, this would be much more concerning because you can draw three hundred thousand viewers for a rerun of almost anything on on broadcast television so if if this was on abc there would be a whole lot of why are we doing this um with it being on espn espn2 fx that's a little bit of a different conversation i uh, do would you expect knowing kind of the marketing brand we have behind this and the rock and Danny and everybody coming in here and, you know, it's three years now past and we're trying to re you know, get this resurgence. Would you expect better? Are you okay with this or would you expect worse? Well, I think there's a couple of interesting things here. I think um, in particular, if you compare it to the USFL, that's interesting because the USF, uh, so the XFL is broadcast on the Disney networks, but Disney does not own it. The Rock and Danny Garcia own it. Whereas the USFL is an owned property by Fox Sports. And so Fox has a whole lot of incentive to make that work for them and to like take even bad ratings and keep rolling with it and hopefully grow it into a thing overall. With the XFL, uh, there is a chance that these bad ratings could lead to some consequences maybe like if it's if it's continuously bad if it's not really doing anything for espn and if it's not really worth their time there's a chance they renegotiate that contract get out of it early whatever i think that at this point it's certainly not a like this is terrible let's bail on it absolutely discussion but i think it's something certainly that everyone involved is keeping an eye on and if it isn't necessarily better if it doesn't get better when there's less competition, then there's some major concerns and some major potential impacts. What do you think the thought process is behind, you know, and even on here, obviously ESPN's carrying a good bulk of here, you know, the women's basketball women's and men's basketball. basketball and all that, but you know, we're, we're putting it's kind of the leftover. We're just putting it on effects. Like we're not trying to prioritize mm -hmm. it. Uh, like you said, ESPN isn't incentivized the same way that Fox and NBC is mm -hmm. to to position that. Uh, uh, thoughts behind that? Any other things to add? Well, uh, the NBC component of the USFL is interesting because they are not incentivized. Like they do not own it. it uh, making it good is not good for them long term. So they do it when it works for them. It's a different conversation with Fox because there's equity there and there's a future in making the league into being something. So the NBC, NBC with the USFL is much more comparable to ESF, ESPN with the XFL of like, they'll broadcast it when it works for them. They'll continue to do so if it continues to work for them, if it continues to be valuable programming for them. But there isn't, a, a, there isn't really a push to try and get it over. Uh, you know, I mean, we're seeing even on here, you know, NASCAR, uh, you know, at one point, you know, 01 million here, FS1. I mean, I view that as a comparable network size of, of, of FX, right? The FS1 in terms of like clearance. Uh, uh, how how positioned is FX? I know that part of this was them wanting to use the XFL to drive people to FX to view it as a sports mm -hmm. channel. But you know, what is the, the the scope of FX as far as you can, you know, as far as you know? Yeah, well, I mean, that, that history is all interesting, of course, because FX used to be a Fox thing and was sold to Disney as part of the giant Disney Fox sale a few a few years ago. And um, yeah, it, it has, it, it definitely doesn't have a majority sports identity at this point. It has a mostly uh, scripted, uh, scripted TV identity, things like what we do in the shadows and so on. It's a fine channel to throw a sports thing on in terms of what you were talking about with, with carriage. It has acceptable carriage 
relative to an FS1 or relative to uh, to whatever. It's not the issues we were running into a few years ago where sports stuff was winding up on FS2, which is way lower numbers of homes. So people, th there's a decent amount of people that can get to FX if they want. The challenge is that they have to be motivated to get there. So they have to be seeking out this XFL content rather than just tune into the channel and, oh, it's there. There we go. Me, I, now the lawnmower is pulling up here. We got it. We're all windows closed. We're all ready to go. Um, are you, you know, as we, we've talked about this at nauseum on the podcast, you know, it seems to be the philosophy of the XFL is, you know, we're going to post on Twitter, have the rock retweet it, post on Instagram, have the rock retweet it. Are you surprised there hasn't been more national a national marketing push, a national, you know, any sort of like, hey, th this is happening in, you know, either across America, this is happening on TV or in specific markets, this is happening in your market? Yeah, um, it's, it's a difficult question because I think, yes, absolutely. I think they're doing the social marketing part of it decently. And I think The Rock in particular has helped in bringing some awareness to this. I think they're also, they're finding some success with the social clips of like, even at Awful announcing that the comeback are shared uh, general sports site. We've had some XFL clips take off decently when we post them on Twitter and so on. So there's some interest in this. I think they're doing it okay on the social side. They could invest more, sure, in promoting the actual games and that the game these games are coming, that these are going to be going on, but that also becomes a, an investment ver, an investment uh, versus reward debate of like, is it worth spending that much for X marginal gain of viewers that you don't even know you're necessarily going to hit? So I don't know. I mean, and I think the other thing to keep in mind here is that while this is the latest version of the XFL, in many ways, this is a new league. It's very different from what's come before. And there's always growing pains for new leagues, and it takes time to build up that brand identity and convince people, hey, you should tune into this thing. So I think with any new football league in particular, like surviving the first season is the big thing. And if they can do that, then maybe there becomes more of a marketing push afterwards. Is talking USFL last year, you know, that was their big, you know, what was and has been their big, hey, we're the first spring league in, mm -hmm. you know, decades to to not mm -hmm. only crown a champion and return for a second season, because obviously the XFL didn't do that. I would argue, you know, the, the spring league that that uh, begat the mm -hmm. USFL, you know, I, I watched the Mega Bowl. I mean, I, I know that, uh, was it Ryan Willis, right, was the champion over there with the linemen or whatever, if I remember mm -hmm. that, right? Uh, but, um, you know, USFL dipped came back it felt mid-season cold to me the championship game did decent viewership here is this just a mid-season lull th that we should expect a rebound i mean obviously too early to tell but but it, you know it's gone down every week and all i see online right now is like xfl ratings are crazy and xfl ratings are crazy and like uh, if i'm an xfl fan how should i feel yeah i mean i think you should you should certainly feel somewhat concerned like the these current numbers if this was the numbers every week i don't know that this would be a viable thing for anyone I, but i think there are there is context to these numbers of the other things going on there's con there's context to what it's competing for eyeballs with i think the big question is really what it does going forward and how that's going to look and i think the other the other thing to keep to keep in, keep in mind there is just like all of these leagues have had bad numbers at some points. And so the USFL is an interesting one on that point where I think that the Fox ownership really helped them alleviate a, a lot of the questions that they would have had just from the ratings numbers. They've had very public and they very publicly stated this multi-year commitment from Fox to funding this league and keeping it going. So the XFL doesn't necessarily have that. I think there's a few more uh, questions about how long everyone involved is going to keep doing this if it doesn't produce. And um, one thing the XFL very much does have going for it, though, is that it has at least a more 
credible claim to actually being in its markets by playing these games in the home markets versus what the USFL has been doing. Uh, that's an interesting question. And obviously this week is an anomaly, you know, in terms of the super low ratings, but you know, 256,000, you know, Houston at Seattle, we had, I believe 9,100 reported audience there. I was there at Lumen field last week for that mm -hmm. game where we, uh, you know, the sea dragons won like, is that worth going and, and paying, you know, doing the Lumen Field and flying everybody up? And and if, if we're getting a quarter million people anyway, I, I understand that, yes, it's better to say we're in the markets and all that. But if you're getting a quarter million people, is it better off just playing at Choctaw and Arlington? Yeah, I'm. well, I mean, I think that's a question. I think that it depends on what your league is valuing. Um, I think it's it's certainly better from a perspective of actually connecting with local fans. It's better from a perspective of selling tickets. I mean, the USFL attendance was really dismal in a lot of ways from playing all last year, from playing all the games in one location. And it really, I think it in a lot of ways that really hurt their attempts to integrate with other markets and even get local media coverage. I mean, I was surprised at how much local media coverage they were able to pull off for teams that really don't have any connection to those cities. But even, even with that, like I think the XFL is doing a little bit better on that front from actually having some games there, even if the teams aren't based there all year round. It is an, it is an expense. Absolutely. It becomes a further operating expense. It becomes a further challenge on that front. But I think especially if you're if you're looking at it for the long term, like I think the XFL is establishing a decent presence in markets like Seattle and so on from doing this, from having games at those spots versus just the like, OK, you've got this team name and that's all we're giving you. I just, and I know it's year one. And like you said, there's always growing pains. I just, you know, we had, uh, Russ Brandon was at the event mm -hmm. where they announced the hub and we, you know, we mm -hmm. talked with him there and with Danny and the rock and everybody. And, you know, he, I said, how, you know, we saw the USFL, we lived through all this and he's, how are you guys going to do it different? He goes, well, we're, mm -hmm. you know, going to be in markets. We're going to be hitting the ground. We're going to be the mm -hmm. first people there. The last people leaving. We're really going to, I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I, if, if, you know, just to take the Thursday game last week, for example, I don't know if flying in the afternoon of a, of mm -hmm. a Thursday game in Seattle, flying out at 10 o'clock, getting back home at whatever time they did in the morning that, you know, we saw Ben DiNucci talking about it for the post game. Like, I don't know if that's like, that doesn't speak to me as going all in on this market. That seems like we got to be as cheap as possible. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, if you're trying to book a flight for a, you know, you're working at a conference, like, well, I got to fly in, gives mm -hmm. me just enough time to get from the airport to the hotel. And I'm going to book it on the other end. Okay. I might have to cut out a few minutes early. I got to get back to the hotel. Like it just doesn't feel to me as like, we have this long-term uh, investment right now. It feels like we're trying to have our cake of being in markets, but also like we want to save as much as possible and only be there as minimally as we can. Yeah. I mean, I, I fully agree with that. Like it's absolutely a half measure. There's absolutely more they could do if they were in the markets on a more full-time basis. But I do think like it's a notable half measure and a step up over the USFL. Like, I mean, I'm a big alternative football fan, any sort of alternative football whatsoever. US, I live in New Orleans and the USFL has a New Orleans breakers team, but They've never set foot in this city. They had a coach who coached a whole season without ever saying foot in this city. And so, like, I can't go to a New Orleans Breakers game, whereas that feels a little different in the XFL with even this limited approach. Are you hyped for the four hubs here in the April? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a step up, at least. Like, it's a step up from what they were doing, but... They're still not here, so I'm still not super thrilled about it. <laughs> See, now you're going to get everyone saying, oh, Reed only brought Andrew on because he's yeah. a big hater. No, I mean, again, no. I just reached out, and I never, like, I don't even really care your opinion before you come on. I just want people that are knowledgeable in the space that can talk about it. So, you know, I, yeah, it, it's better. I don't know. I, I don't think that this is the answer either. I don't think that, sure. like, the, the, mm -hmm. the, um, whatever you want to call it day, like just, you know, sending in the troops just for the, the blast you know, we did some of the stuff and we had events here and I know we're getting through. I just, what I, and I worried the same with the USFL, like, you know, if we get enough of these articles that don't have the context by the end of the year, you know, then you get ready for season two and it's like, God, they lost 
whatever viewership and who cares, like is the damage going to be too done or do you think they can live through this? Well, I mean, I think the thing, so I think that when it comes to the viewership and the ratings, the article, the articles are interesting, but the articles don't actually matter, right? Like what's actually going to matter is not like how sites like ours are writing it up. It's going to matter how the executives at the TV networks and at the league actually feel about these things. And if you're, if you're Fox with the USFL and if you have that ownership interest, it's a lot easier to shrug whatever off as acceptable. With the XFL, it's maybe more of a question, but it's also still like, it all depends on a variety of things, right? Like, uh, and that's the thing with any sort of ratings discussion is that like ratings are not uh, raw viewer, not higher numbers of viewers are always better. Absolutely. But there's a whole lot of context to that of like, what are you paying for the rights? What are you paying on production? Uh, what other things would you be showing if you were not showing this? What sort of viewership would those draw? So it, it's not necessarily about like, this number is bad, this number is good. It's about how is this doing compared to what you're paying for it and how it would do, how replacement programming would do. Uh, but I mean, to be fair, the ratings this week were quite poor. <laughs> Oh yeah! Oh, ab absolutely. Okay. And, uh, well, uh, no, I mean they're they're absolutely poor, and I think that if it that is a trend for the whole thing, I don't know that it continues to work. But I, yeah, the the difference to me, and and I think we talked. I can't remember who it was on here a couple of weeks ago, and. You know, these are both competing leagues, right? We have the USFL and the XFL. But I think fundamentally they exist in, in really different spaces where, like we've said, Fox, this, you know, USFL could be a money loser for them. They're, hey, we're, we're this is a business expense, right? We're writing this off. I mean, it's basically mm -hmm. a write-off. I, I think the most disingenuous thing that was ever, you know, this is a, a, a low or high bar, but on Colin Coward, when he talked about like, you know, the profitability of Fox with the USFL, I'm like, how could this not be profitable? Like they're, they're you know, utilizing secondhand people that work at Fox or doing social media. Now this year they're hiring people and all that. Like, of course it's going to be profitable. If anything, you want it to be not profitable so you can write off this stuff, but they want cheap content. We want to fill our TV. We're going to fill three hours times two weekends, whatever. I do think Danny and the rock and everyone I've heard from them really want to build this into a separate league. Are you, do you, how do you view the, the ownership mentality of both of these uh, entities? Well, I, I think that's fair on some levels. I think absolutely. Um, Danny and the rock and the XFL ownership, they're, they're much more concerned with this as an overall business rather than as part of a TV business. I think there's some of that there with Fox as well. And in particular, there have been some reports of they want outside investment and there have been some reports of ultimately they'd love to turn these teams over to local ownership groups, right? So like, the, and which is interesting too, because that brings in a further conversation of like, oh, all of a sudden now you're operating this as a startup and it can lose money if you're able to sell it for a profit in the end. So it, it, with with all of this, yes, it becomes about it becomes about ownership models. It becomes about like what your eventual plan is, and I think that is very different for the USFL and for the XFL. And like, and if we're really talking alternative football, it's very different for the CFL as well, because like for them, the whole US thing is entirely a side business com compared to where they actually make their money. <laughs> How many, you know, let's say USFL really does want to sell, like we really want to sell off. We've got the FedEx mm -hmm. guy or whatever. Mm -hmm. We really want to sell in Memphis. I, I mean, five years, if, if with that, like, would you even invest in the USFL team in, in five years, in three? Like, what would be a, you know, you cover sports business, a reasonable, like, okay, I've seen a proof of concept now for long enough, enough seasons. And, you know, and I, if the XFL wants to sell off too, we can do that. But for really to bring in an outside investor to buy one of these teams. Well, it, 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 I mean, I think that is entirely a startup conversation, and it depends on your tolerance for risk. And if you look at if you look at startup businesses overall, so if you invest incredibly early on, if you invest in an alpha round or whatever, a lot of those things are never going to go anywhere. If they do, you're going to cash in at a huge rate. And I think that's exactly the conversation with these football leagues of like, 
if you want to buy into the USFL or the XFL now, you're going to, and if it does eventually succeed, you'll get a huge return for that. For it to actually be proven and successful as a thing that's going to last for long term, you're going to want to come in after three or five years. And I think even like making it through one season is impressive as an alternative football league, considering how that has gone recently. So like the USFL already has an advantage on that front. They've done one thing. They've awarded a champion. They haven't folded. There haven't been huge stories about missing payroll or anything. That's fine. And like, and if you are a risk minded investor, I could absolutely see gaining on this right now. But it's going to you're going to have a much better idea of the overall direction of the thing in three to five years. Oh, so, I mean, Andrew says invest in the USFL now. I mean, <laughs> yeah. there you go, right? They should be <laughs> lying that deep. Um, anything else? I mean, state of state of spring football right now. I'm still trying to figure out like what theme we're going with this week, but I just thought it was important to kind of get some context in here, you know. Uh, should I be blowing in the paper bag, trying to call myself? Should I walk, you know, walk away from the step away from, you know, the, the uh, sharp knives or anything like what, what should I be doing right now? Well, I mean, I think, I think the general sense for me at least is everything's fine until people say it's not fine. And, imp- and until important people say it's not fine. Like, it doesn't matter what we write or what anyone writes or what anyone writes about the ratings. What matters about the ratings is if all of a sudden you start having panicked emails at Disney or panicked emails at XFL headquarters or at the USFL of like, this isn't sustainable. That's an actual problem. And everything can be tolerable in the right circumstance and it, it, but that also goes back to the startup conversation and how long are you willing to endure losses and so i don't know that anyone needs to panic right now i don't know if there's any imminent signs of any of this folding this is certainly all better than the, the mid-season of the aaf where they couldn't figure out how to pay people so uh, i i think the, the the big thing at the moment is hey, there's some reasons for concern. There are some reasons this may not work out long term, but no one seems to be really pulling up stakes just yet. I think you helped me with my theme right there. I think I can use the, you know, this is fine, the dog or whatever sitting <laughs> yeah, in yeah. the sitting in the room. Kind of, well, there you go, Andrew. Andrew, you helped me workshop the theme this week for the show. So with XFL ratings, like, this is fine question mark um anything else before i let you go i really appreciate it like i said we just live in this world and you know people are still going to think i bring you in to you know prop up one thing or another but i do appreciate oh, no. outside uh, opinions here yeah no i mean personally i don't i don't have a stake in any of it uh, i i would i would love to see some or all levels of alternative football succeed i do think in general TV executives and league executives are maybe higher on the audience for these alternative football leagues than the actual public is at this point. But that's the thing that can change. That's the thing that can change with time. If uh, highlights keep going viral, if people keep going to the games, if you get actual connections to the community, there's ways for all of this to grow. And maybe in three, five, 10 years or whatever, we're like, what do you mean? There's always been an XFL. There's always been a USFL. But for the moment, it's all in a very new state. It's all in a very fragile state. And that's going to draw a lot of comment and a lot of speculation on where it's actually going. And no one really knows other than the executives at the league and the networks. Uh, so I have one more. So you gave me, a, I have one more question, but then you gave me uh, something here. So sure. you said you always think that maybe there's a, if I listen, if heard this correctly, TV executives believe there's a bigger market for this than there actually maybe is in the public. Can you, can you please expand on that? Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I don't know that for a fact. I don't know what numbers they have talked about internally, but I do feel that Every level of spring football since the original, like, 2001 XFL has not really lived up to maybe what they were hoping for it. And, uh, like, there have been high points, there have been good ratings, especially for various, like, kickoffs and kickoff weekends and whatever. But it, it does feel, in a lot of ways, like a thing that TV is trying to put over that the audience isn't necessarily there on yet. 
So uh, XFL is the Roman reigns of TV. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a reasonable comparison there, yes. <laughs> well, I know that's interesting because I, you know, I, I've, you know, had conversations and people have told, you know, I don't do a lot of like insider talking with people, but, you know, I've heard where like, yeah, you know, maybe expectations, you know, I have said, I think the XFL is far more the CFL of, hey, let's embrace and, mm-hmm. you know, let's get the community and let's go do the fundraiser. So let's go work mm-hmm. in the, the, the local cities and bring in fan podcasts and kind of do all this stuff versus the NFL that's like, F you, you're going to mm-hmm. watch or not. Oh, and absolutely. I don't. Yeah. And I don't know if, like you've said, if all the executives or whoever at XFL or USFL for that regard, you know, because USFL, I think, views themselves pretty high brow too, right? Like, well, we're the USFL, like we're a real football. I don't know if either one of them knows who exactly they're, I'm doing a lot of hands. If either of them really knows who their target demo is, I don't know. I don't know if they are really aware of, of who's actually watching all the time. Yeah, well, I mean, yes, I, I don't know that I don't know that they are. I don't know how deeply they dive into it. But I think there, there's two interesting and different potential demographics for these kinds of alternative football things. One is people who are hardcore alternative football fans who are going to maybe go to a game in person, buy some merch, buy some jerseys, listen to shows like this, that sort of thing. The other is people who are like, it's spring, it's Saturday, there's no, oh, look, there's some football on. I'll throw it on even though I know nothing about these teams or these players. And the in, the interesting thing to me is that those are two very different groups to appeal to. And the, like, the idea of going to markets, doing more stuff in markets, that all matters for that first group. It does not matter at all for that second group. The second group, you want to do the approach of let's play it all in one hub, let's do it as cheaply as possible, it's a made-for-TV product. So I think it's interesting to sort of consider from that front. And ultimately, you want to try and grow both those groups, but you have to do slightly different things to, mar- to appeal to them. I would I would also add a third of like the fantasy degenerate kind of sport. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That I think both XFL and USFL like, OK, wait, we know we need to do this. I don't think either one of them has sent a particularly, you know, I don't think putting the over under and talking about hitting mm-hmm. the over 18 times during the broadcast is, is appealing to the sports better. I think there's things they're doing and we've had conversations about this, but uh, you know, I would say that's kind of a third group in there, but that's interesting mm-hmm. that it's, you know, yeah. Cause the USFL is, is really kind of a hardcore, I think just in on if it's on Fox at three o'clock on Saturday, there's going to mm-hmm. be, quarter million or uh, three quarters of a million people that are probably going to watch this well and uh, the other thing to consider there too is uh, with fox with fox this is a, such a big thing for them because of the stuff they don't have right like they don't have the college basketball they, uh, they they have some regular season but they don't have the men's or the women's ncaa tournament they don't they don't have the nhl they don't have the nba this is a product for them at a time of year where they don't have a lot of live sports stuff going on. And so it has higher value to them as a, as a, as a, a, a follow to that. Whereas with ESPN, they don't own the XFL. There's a million things they can show. They're going to continue to show the XFL if it works for them, but only if it works for them. I like that. That was good. That might be the one that we share online here. I think that was good. Uh, last question for me. I could talk to you for a long time. I really appreciate it. If if you if if you could talk to Danny the Rock Redbird tomorrow, call him up. The answer. What would be your advice for them here going through the rest of the season of like marketing? Like, what should you guys be doing? What should you be focusing on? I mean, I think they're doing a bunch of it already. I think the, the way they're doing social to me is smart. And I think the way they bring Dwayne in on various social things is very smart. He has a huge audience there. That's important. I think it's important. Uh, the XFL has done a good job of sharing various viral highlights and things that are maybe going to get at least somewhat on the radar for people who aren't, uh, aren't all right tuned in. I do appreciate their community approach, even as limited as it is, as you mentioned, and I think they're seeing some good results with that. I think in particular with St. Louis and the tickets they're selling there, that is that is an impressive story. I think the, the big thing I would tell them is like, 
this isn't necessarily a huge year one success. That doesn't mean it's not going to be a success year three, year five, whatever. You've got the money. I would say continue to invest in it. Like do so in a smart way. Don't just throw throw money in, into a pit or anything. But I think if you build this smartly, build it a little bit at a time and get set up for a few years, you might see something good in the end. And I think uh, to go back to the CFL, I think that's a big thing that's really worked for that league. It's like it's had so many terrible patches over the years and so many rough patches and so on. But like it keeps ticking. And a big part of why it keeps ticking is just that like it's there. It's a known quantity. You can build on what's come before. You you know that this team is going to be around next year when you put down your season ticket deposit of that. And I think that's a thing that the U.S. alternative leagues have not really found yet is that kind of commitment and that kind of we're going to be here. Uh, awful announcings. Andrew Buckholt says XFL season one, not a success. I got it. <laughs> <We're> all... <laughs> no, but uh, last comment for me. No. And I think that that's right. You know, I just, but I think this is really good, you know, constructive chatting here. When I think it was like week three, it was the weekend of the NFL combine and it was coming out of the weekend. So whatever that was week two, week three. And, you know, the XFL had done like, I think double or triple what the combine did, but it was, Mm -hmm. you know, still only like Mm 660,000 viewers or whatever. And the rock tweeted out like, you know, these aren't great numbers, like, or they're humbling numbers or something like, but we're building on this. Like, Mm -hmm. I just thought that was interesting because the rock is, you know, the biggest, strongest, fastest, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, in air quotes, you know, in any movie doesn't take damage, you know, always has. Mm-hmm. And, and I thought for him to tweet out, like, you know, we're, we're building this and, and these aren't all-star numbers yet, but we're going to build on it. I just thought it was interesting. I just don't see a lot of the rock interacting in that way. No, absolutely. Well, and I think that's interesting and refreshing in the sports TV ratings space in as well of like, so much of what we hear in the rating space is network executives talking about how they're not great numbers are actually great. So to me, that's appreciated when you recognize that there's a lot of room to grow. Uh, Andrew, I really appreciate your time today. I'm glad we made the connection and thanks for hopping on this crazy show and talking through everything. I really value your opinion. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Well, it's been a hot second since I've talked to this gentleman. We had him on for the XFL draft. We did a lot of USFL content last year. We have Cody Main established the run here. I really appreciate your time. How are you, sir? I am good. Happy to be back on the Mark Cast. I missed the uh, XFL kickoff weekend, but yeah, it's been since the XFL draft that we have chatted, and and boy, a lot's happened since then, right? Yeah. Well, I want to get your thoughts, and uh, this is, you know, I we we have Andrew Buckles on this week from Awful Nancy as well. I, I appreciate. We live in this all the time and you are doing a a million other things, which is great. So I always like to get, cause you know, we're, it's like an echo chamber. So how is XFL 2023 for you so far? Yeah, look, I've been around for XFL 2020 was around for USFL and this will be the second pass at XFL. And for those that don't know, I work for established the run. We cover fantasy, the, the fantasy aspect of, you know, these spring leagues, these alt leagues, and that's specifically my title as the director of niche sports, trying to handle all of the nuances that go with the XFL, the USFL, and all these alternative leagues. For me, from, uh, you know, fantasy, sports betting, gambling type perspective, I think the XFL 2023 has been uh, a resounding success from our perspective and in my little community as people that just want to watch the game, have a little bit of action on the game, want to kind of know the players ins and outs and and read you've done a good job of this too with helping communicate injuries helping communicate uh, transactions where there have been changes on depth charts and things of that nature and you know from my perspective if we can sit down know the players that are playing each saturday or sunday or, or thursday as it may be in some cases and can have a little bit of action on the game and a little bit of sweat equity that's perfect so ratings aside everything else aside from you know fantasy and gambling perspective it's been a really good product for us I have seen them now, and like we just had Kurt Ben uh, Beggar get signed today. Like I, I am seeing them now trying to do more tweeting transactions. Right, they're sending out the depth charts and the injury reports. I try to facilitate. We've had other content creators like yourself talking about okay, the, they, these need to come out from the teams, and you know I'm happy to get some followers <laughs> tweeting that <laughs> stuff out. So that's fine. But um, 
compared to, and I will say just, you know, compared to the USFL last year, even the post game stuff I get from the teams and like, here are the stats. This is what happened. Here are the notes. Here's links to things. Uh, I don't think I got any of that last year from USFL. And it seems like things are a little bit more centrally located. And if, if that means coming from you, Reed, if you're the if you're going to be the Adam Schefter of the XFL in terms of reporting injury news and things of that nature, to me, to me, you kind of are because you're the you're kind of the go to source for for depth charts and, and transaction related notes, injury news, things of that nature. So as long as we, as you know, people in the gambling space, can understand where that information is going to come from, where to find it, and add you to our XFL Twitter list, that's really what matters most to me. All of the the extra stuff that they do, reporting from you know the the inactive list from the PR account, uh, you know, getting the the stats out on the website, things are updated in a timely manner. I know back to the USFL days, trying to update our our fantasy projections, our player by player projections. A lot of the injury related news was coming out like overnight in our time zone, you know. So we're waking up the next morning and trying to trying to update things kind of on the fly here. So at least the the general flow of things here for the XFL in 2023 has been has been relatively smooth from my perspective i do yeah i've had there's been a lot of complaints uh, i was just thinking of you know we've had a lot of late games and okay we have like 6 p.m kickoffs and whatever on the pacific coast i, I think that's payback for the usfl and their you know 5 a.m pacific news drops and things in the <laughs> overnight like i think you know i think we got a favor i think the, the east coast got a little bit favor in there um in terms of getting so we've got the transaction stuff anything else you wish that you would see from them you know while we have you on like that would make your job because i think like these leagues know we need to tar- like we need to target you know dfs or we need to do fantasy uh but it, it's more than just putting the over under on the screen or like yeah. scrolling so, so like you know what do they need to do better for you guys I think the in-game stuff that they have done has been incredible. And I'm glad you brought that up because it kind of slipped my mind as well, because it just becomes second nature at some point as someone who's watching these games, you know what the over-under is, but like the general population that's watching these games might not. And, and like, I know there's varying views on gambling and I'm not here to, to, to push gambling or anything of that nature, but uh, I, I think it's a big thing for them to em- at least embrace that community or understand that that community is part of the people that are watching these games have a rooting interest in these games. A lot of my fellow content creators in the sports betting and, and DFS space are now buying merch and buying tickets to games and all this stuff. So it's it's kind of a, a flywheel effect. Once you get the people interested in the games in our community, they're going to support you by all of those things, buying merch, going to games, watching games. Um, I, I think from one perspective, and this is really tough for them to do because a lot of it comes down to the DFS operators, such as DraftKings, FanDuel, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But I wish they would if there's any way for them to more so embrace that community and understand that, that how big fantasy football is for NFL, how big fantasy football is for, from the major leagues, how big fantasy basketball has become and daily fantasy basketball has become for the NBA. I think that's just a great Avenue for them to continue to grow this audience, my audience, you know, and we we're talking about million dollar prize pools every week in the NFL. And now they're getting smaller in, in the XFL because it's just tough to, to gain the attention and gain the trust of this gambling, the sports betting community. So I, I don't know what that, what that necessarily means. I hate coming to the table with a suggestion without really having a solution to offer, but uh, you know, if there was any way for them to, to try and guarantee that there would be more of an emphasis on the fantasy side would be great. And I think, I think our community would respond in droves by, you know, attending games, by watching games and all the things that the XFL is looking to accomplish. Well, because even, you know, even some of the depth charts we post and some of them, you know, they'll say on there like, you know, subject to change or you have the quarterbacks, they'll say, you know, you know, Quentin Dormady or, you know, yeah. you know, Quentin Flowers or whatever. Um, you know, I, 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 I get a lot of feedback when I post those, right. People sometimes like, oh, well, I thought this was going to be an I, And so, yeah, I, I think they need to, you know, and I know there's competitive advantage and all of that, but, you know, I always look at it. If I was building the XFL the same way I do this show where, Okay, I want I want as many different little things to attract a bigger audience, right? Like not everyone's going to care about Larry Smith this week coming on from the CFL, but if I can get you talking fantasy and previewing him, okay, we get Stormy. Like you know, I want and so if it's the XFL, like anything I could do that really doesn't cost a lot of money to to put this information out, you know, updating Google Drives or whatever, like that's free. Anything you can do to further incentivize, I just I think it's a no brainer that I would want as many of these little avenues as I could. 
And it's almost the, the more the merrier, right? I don't think there's you could ha- you could necessarily have too much information. I think one thing that would be great, probably not nearly as cost effective as some of the things that we've already talked about, but a beat reporter type type situation, a, a, a credential beat reporter that is paid by the XFL or by the team or wh- however that would work for each team to kind of report those news, those nuggets, those things that we don't necessarily get by seeing the depth charts, by seeing the the you know weekly reports or the tweets from yourself. I know a lot of people are are digging and diving and have have rapport like yourself and connections, but it would be great uh, if there was kind of a centrally located and credentialed team type access that we would get from, from each, each team individually and certain, certain information that was, was reported from each team. But those are things that are wishful thinking. It's, it's also a part of what creates a little bit of an edge and why I find this so fascinating from, you know, a fantasy and from a gambling angle is because this information isn't readily available like it is for, you know, the NFL or for the the NBA, you have to dig for this information. And I think that that gives a competitive advantage. And, and for anyone that's trying to, you know, enjoy the XFL and make a little bit of money while doing it, then, you know, I think it's, it's a huge advantage to be paying as close attention as, you know, some of us are. Yeah, I think it's, I've talked to fancy guys last year in the USFL. And I think I even, you know, Adam Levitan and stuff are talking like, uh, Oh, I love this because the information isn't out there and I'm able to game the system. Like, yeah, okay. Like, yeah, it's like, personally, that's great for you. I know I, I, the beat report thing. Cause like, you know, they have Josh now, Josh does like the XFL and I don't really listen to, I'm sorry, but like, you know, I try to watch like XFL today and support some of this stuff. Like, you know, I wish Josh, as opposed to doing like a, a weekly recap show, which a lot of people do like, yeah, I, I think like, let's use his resources. So let's use, I know they have another beat reporter now that was, writing up press releases or something like let's utilize them more to, like you said the not readily available like yeah um like uh trail buckley does uh press conferences every week right on zoom like a lot of people can watch and share like let's get josh doing stuff that not everyone's gonna have access yeah. to i like that idea if, like we already have people hired maybe let's focus their attentions differently yeah, agreed. And how can we get more access to the players? How can we, not even from a fantasy perspective at this point, but how can we build <clears throat> storylines and narratives around players? And how can we get people to be invested in the athletes that they're watching each and every week? We know all of the the NFL players. How can you get me to to know the XFL players, understand the the journey that they're on right now? And, and I think that that creates a, a deeper respect from your audience and a deeper love for the game and for the product that they're putting on the field. All right, so uh, anything else here? We'll go week six. We'll talk the matchups. Uh, I'm excited. My wife's going to be out of town this weekend for a bachelorette party. I'm going to be locked in. I haven't had, I've had like some Sundays, but I'm like, I'm all in. I got Kraken playing. I've got Sea Dragons here. Uh, week six, uh, you know, first off here is, you know, Sea Dragons going into Orlando. This seems easy to me, but any thoughts you have on this matchup? Yeah, look, the, the line here has ballooned up to nine and a half. I think it initially opened at eight and a half. And, and the Sea Dragons, I think, are one of those teams that their record is not indicative of how good they are. We know the first two weeks of the season, they kind of had those two heartbreaking losses. And, and Ben DiNucci, to start the season, just had some, some ball security issues. And I think he's corrected a lot of those issues. I think he's now, if not the best, one of the best quarterbacks in the league. And if you're coming from a fantasy perspective, if, if you followed any of my content through XFL 2020, through through USFL, through this season, you know that I love these these high tempoed uh, up pace offenses that are going to drop back a lot. And that's exactly what June Jones is doing with Seattle. The, the wide receiver core that they can trot out there is, is as deep as any that we've seen in spring football. I absolutely love this team. I think that uh, it's it's your sea dragons all the way this week. I, I- you know, I we I listened to Ben at the post game, and Ben had. I mean, we were there. We were at Lumen Field. Really bad game. I think you know one touchdown, the three turnovers, and he's screaming for Josh Gordon to get benched, and you know, a lot of frustrations. After the game and the post game, he was talking like he's exhausted, and they've had these Thursday games. Maybe having the you know he's got ten days off now. I think from like maybe he just needs a break here to kind of refresh. Like, I mean, what do you think of Ben trying to clean up and, and figure out? Because you can't be trying. I mean, we can't have three interceptions every game turnovers every game and <laughs> uh, what do you think ben needs to do yeah and who would have thought that that game the the sea dragons rough next game would have been the one game of the week that kind of turned into uh, for lack of a better term kind of a dumpster fire you know a lot of the rest of these games last week and week five really delivered uh and then we see a 13 to 12 kind of uh meh type uh ugly slop fest from these two high-powered offenses you know i, I i'm one to believe that turnovers are inherently random and, and certainly there are players that have more control over them than others, but there have been a couple of uh, Danucci fumbles that have either should have not been fumbles or just completely fluky type plays. 
but I think he will clean up the, the interceptions certainly needs to be, be cleaned up. I think over the course of, you know, a full season, I think that Ben Brandon Silvers, AJ McCarron, kind of the three top quarterbacks in the league. I think they're going to regress close to what we would expect from, you know, a season long average from them. Whereas, you know, danucci has got seven interceptions as of right now. I, I tend to believe that that's going to come back closer to what the league wide average would be. And he's not going to be some interception machine for the rest of the season. I'm a big believer in the sea dragons offense. I think they have, you know, what it takes to, to certainly go all the way. Uh, I didn't hear, um, in terms of the Guardians, you know, we had Quentin Dormady sorry, played really good last week in, in the loss against the Vipers. Uh, him, I, I presumably getting the start again. Uh, did that excite you at all here seeing you know, Orlando, even through a loss, feel like they had a little bit more life, even though they, they have all started their way into the <laughs> to the end of the game. What did you make of um, Orlando coming out of the Vipers game now going into week six? You know, it's tough because both of these both of these teams had struggled in the win-loss column, and I think both of them played, albeit sloppy on occasions, and albeit the defense not looking great uh, on, on either side. But I think the offense has played really well, and I think Quentin Dormady gave them a huge spark last week, 22-25 coming in in relief of Paxton Lynch, and maybe he gave them a little bit of, little bit of a spark, which I hope, because from a fantasy perspective, this wide receiver core is a ton of fun and a lot of fun to try and take shots on if you're playing daily fantasy from, from Cody Latimer, who has looked like an absolute matchup nightmare in this league. Like we've seen some of these bigger wide receivers slash tight end hybrids do. Uh, and then you've got the trio at, at wide receiver between Eli Rogers, Lance Lenore and Charleston Rambo, who I think all offer very unique skill sets. I hope Quentin Dormady gets the start this week, which I assume he will. And I, I hope they can try and keep pace with the sea dragons offense. I'm not sure that they can, but I would love to see a shootout here. I would love to see the Guardians get get on the, the win column, maybe not against your Sea Dragons. But uh, I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic about this team now than I was, you know, two weeks ago. Uh, Quentin Flowers, not on. I mean, are we off Quentin already? That seems weird. They, they have DeAndre Vrance. I mean, I know he had the concussion and stuff. And uh, I think there's other things going on there as well with that. But uh, in terms of... Uh, I, Quentin Flowers, I didn't look great in the game. It looked like someone that was kind of signed off the street. Yeah, I mean, what a series of events for the the Quentin Dormaday stuff, given the fact that they you know, released, bring back, and then not only brought back, but comes in and, and plays a dynamite game against the Vipers last week. I'm kind of led to believe at this point in time, this is going to be his show until further notice. Uh, we're kind of projecting as much for established the run this week. And, you know, I think he's a, he's an interesting option for fantasy. And I think that he's got, you know, he's got something to prove. I think he, he looked capable last week. And I think that that might be enough, uh, you know, to, to get his weapons, the ball a little bit. Uh, in terms of, I was going to pull up. So the next game here is at, you know, I talked Jeff and on the show this week. Jeff's, you know, feeling good. We had, you know, we had a win. It was almost a loss. You know, Orlando, that was just, a cr- I came home. We were at dinner and I came home and watched. The- I'm like, oh, I'm so excited. I watched the last quarter of this game. I was like, what the hell is going on here? Uh, I don't know if Vegas can maintain the momentum coming in here, especially with the St. Louis off a loss. So what do you make of this matchup? And I'm trying to find the charts here. Yeah, I think St. Louis is probably just in a different class. Uh, you know, I think there's, and as we'll go through, I think there's kind of a clear uh, tier one, maybe another clear tier two with a couple of teams. Uh, St. Louis certainly in that tier, in my opinion. And then it's kind of a slew of guys uh, and, and teams next before we get to Orlando. And I think St. Louis is probably that tier two team that should probably be fa- favored by more than three points this week, particularly after kind of that emotional win, Vegas getting kind of off the schneid last week and getting that win over Orlando. I'm curious what they do at the quarterback position. It would seem, in, in my opinion, that they're going to keep rolling out Luis Perez, uh, although we, we've kind of projected a little bit of Brent Hundley here and there, but it just didn't seem like they had any interest. And again, as someone who doesn't have all of the information readily available, I don't know if that's an injury-related thing. Is that a, a performance-related thing? Whatever it may be, Luis Perez looked good. This team also, speaking of Jeff Pedet, a ton of weapons that are a lot of fun to watch. CK Sweeting has been an absolute dynamite uh, anytime he's gotten the ball. And then we've loved uh, Geronimo Allison and Martavis Bryant dating back to their NFL days. So seeing them with the ball in their hands has been a lot of fun. Perez has been a guy that's capable of getting it into their hands. So I like this offense. I just think that this St. Louis side is a little bit too much for them this week. Yeah, Luis is weird. Like, it, it, I think it was one of our, we do our Monday, like, post game. I think it was on one of them, Andrew Murray, I think, was talking. Like, Luis just can't be, like, a week-to-week 
Like he's not going to be your guy. Like he'll he'll have a great week and then whatever, and then he'll like because he played incredible. He played incredible yeah. against Orlando. You know, was getting the post game and the Vipers are retweeting. You know, Luis M F Perez and all this stuff, and you know Jeff Bidette's talking about him here, but. You know, obviously you would think they bring in Brett Huntley, a highest paid guy. I do think he's suffering with like some hamstring or there's some lower body stuff going on, but it just doesn't seem like you said clear. Uh, you know, Brett was uh, benched, I guess, uh, against was that the DC game. And they said yeah. it was, you know, it, it was performance related. It wasn't performance related. It's just weird. I, I don't know. I can't get a, get a handle on their quarterback situation. And, and Perez has played good to his credit. It's it's one of those things where I feel like I've been short on, on Luis Perez dating back to the USFL days. And, and I've been proven wrong in almost every stop. Every time it seems like he goes under center, he's he's not only doing enough, he's he's outperforming my expectations and a lot of others' expectations. 65.3% completion rate, uh, 7.9 yards per attempt this season, an 8-3 to three touchdown to interception ratio. Of course, a lot of that coming in the last game, but I... He's exceeded expectations. I think he's an interesting option. Uh, again, like I said, I just think that this this St. Louis team is kind of in that tier two, probably you know unto itself. I, I think that they're one of those teams that's got a shot to uh, to run the tables and, and take home the championship as well. We're talking here, obviously DC. It's DC's world right now in the North. You know, that number two spot between Seattle and St. Louis. Uh, who would you ultimately, you know, when they and I don't even know the schedule coming up, but who would you put there at the number two between Seattle and St. Louis? Yeah, look, I think it's Seattle right now, and a lot of that's just going to go back to probably a personal bias for for June Jones and a personal bias for just seeing these pass happy offenses that have have a, a very long track record of being successful and being efficient. It's a unique beast to try and deal with, and we saw you know two two coaches that are very familiar with one another, AJ Smith and, and June Jones, of course, familiar with e- each other's offenses. We saw them kind of stymie one another. In week five, I wonder if if anyone else will be able to, to kind of match that blueprint going forward. But Seattle, I like the Roughnecks as well. We'll see how big that John Trey Kirkland injury ends up being for them. That's a huge loss. But that next group to me, obviously, DC's world. I want to talk about them in a second, of course, because this run-heavy nature has been a lot of fun to watch on the opposite end of kind of that, that pass-happy spectrum. But I think anyone between Seattle, St. Louis, or Houston on any any given day given their best performance could certainly topple this DC team. I'm glad it felt like Seattle's defense. And we've had, you know, coach has it like big, you know, he's coming in. He's like, I'm not even want to talk offense. I'm leaving that to June Jones. And I felt like our defense didn't play phenomenally well. The first few weeks, I, when we were had that shutout going into the half against the roughnecks, I mean, this is insane. I would just never think. And like you said, I don't know, part of that, you know, the June AJ and them kind of being able to kind of, you know, give info how you know, kind of know what each person's doing. But I thought that we played a lot better on that side of the ball. And now if Danucci can kind of stop yelling at his wide receivers <laughs> and you know and Jim Haslett can can stop at threatening to kill Ben Danucci. That's still my favorite clip of the XML season thus far. It's it's impressive that these I love these coaching staffs where it's like, hey, I know my strength and I'm gonna let the other guy handle his thing and he's gonna let me do my thing. And we're seeing that with Wade Phillips and AJ Smith. Wade Phillips seems very hands off, letting AJ do his thing, kind of be the uh, the boy genius that AJ Smith has proven to be at this point. And it's a very similar thing as you mentioned with Jim Haslett and June Jones. It's like let let the guys cook, <laughs> and, and they're allowing these offensive guys to do that. And, and June Jones and AJ Smith have been an absolute treat to this point. I love both of those offenses. I would love nothing more than to see uh, see a, re, uh, a rematch here between the Sea Dragons and the Roughnecks. Uh, we'll we'll see if it gets that far. But yeah, I, lo- I love I love those teams. Uh, all right, moving on here, Brahmas, Renegades. I have this one here as well. Uh, you know, I said we saw you know Ben Kurt get you know signed. Obviously, that's not going to come into factor this week. Uh, this was not a great game last Sunday. The was it nine to twelve or whatever the final was. Yeah, uh, we get the rematch now. This is at, at Renegades. I'm a little scared for this for ratings and for attendance and kind of everything else. But in terms of on the field play, what what you know, what do you think the Brahmas need to do to be competitive? Yeah, look, Reed, this one, I wish there was a lot of a lot of nice things to say about the Brahmas Renegades rematch here back to back weeks. But I don't think there's very few, very many things uh, I can paint in a positive picture for this matchup. Looking just across the board at at totals for this week, 42 and a half for that Sea Dragons game, 45 for the Battle Hawks Vipers and then 43 for the Roughnecks Defenders, which we'll get to next. This game is down at 33, a whole 10 points lower than the next highest. It's really tough to talk optimistically about offenses uh, on either side. We've got the the injury with Reed Sinet. We've got Kurt Bankert signing. We really don't know what's going to happen at the quarterback position for the Brahmas. I loved Kyle Sloter 
not only dating back to the USFL days, but dating even prior to that in the NFL preseason when uh, I, I don't mean this facetiously or hyperbolically, this he was one of the NFL's best preseason passers uh, over a large enough sample size, you know, completing 74% of his passes, a really high touchdown interception ratio. It's It's been tough for me as a fan to kind of reconcile how has that not translated more from the NFL preseason into the USFL, into the XFL. So I don't know if they're going to go back to Drew Plitt or if this is going to be Kyle Sloter's show going forward. I would imagine that they, the fact that they pulled off the win last week is probably a feather in his cap. These teams are just rotating through, you know, wide receiver pieces, running back pieces that it's just really tough from a, a fantasy perspective to get really excited about. The one steady force on the Renegade side has been Sal, Sal Canella as, you know, kind of the team's pass catcher one and operating that tight end slash wide receiver role. He's been phenomenal as well. I, it's tough for the San Antonio side, and it's tough to be too negative and too hard on them because they've dealt with just so many injuries through their wide receiver core. It sounds like they're going to get Landon Akers back, who – played really well in week one, but then they lose Jalen Tolliver. They've lost, you know, a, a lot of these guys on from this wide receiver course. So I just don't think there's a ton of continuity there. I think this game probably plays under, probably plays pretty slow. And like you said, from a ratings perspective, it's not going to be one that if people do tune into, aren't going to be tuning in for long. because so I think it's going to kind of be an ugly football game. Yeah, take the under. I think Mike Mitchell was talking on. Uh, we were group chatting last week during this game. So whatever the whatever it is, go under. <laughs> go under, because you know it's insane here. Arlington's three and two. Uh, I, I mean, the most boring. I, I I can't even imagine that they're you know plus five hundred. Right? I just it, it's insane. Uh, I feel bad for Anthony Miller. He covers the Renegades there for the you know he'll be at Choctaw. I think they need to have espresso or something up in the press box to keep these guys awake for this. Like it's. I don't know. It's a, it's. I don't think the Renegades were great in 2020, but it's certainly kind of a far cry right now with Bob Stoops and everything else. And that's the thing. I mean, we, the, the I think the teams that we've been most excited about to this point have really boasted strong coaching staffs, really experienced coaching staffs, and and coaching staffs that know their strengths. And I thought coming into this, Bob Stoops, uh, Chuck Long, John Hayes, I thought that this offense would be humming, and to not see them performing even even at expectation, let alone above expectation, has been a bummer. Maybe they get some some you know uh, some life in there, and, and I know Victor Bolden was recently signed. I loved him in his USFL days for the Birmingham Stallions. Maybe there's a, an injection of life into this offense. I will say at three and two, they kind of control their destiny at least to make the playoffs. And once we know, as they always say, once we get to the playoffs, uh, anything can happen. So could this team beat the Roughnecks and then go in and 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 not shock the world in the XFL championship game? Sure. Uh, I just think that this North, that this division, it, it kind of belongs to Houston and the Renegades are just a, a very distant second. Yeah. Victor Bolden coming in, signing a couple other, you know, transactions this week. I don't know if, if again, do they come in? Is it too quick to come in to get down? You know, this game's in Arlington. Like that's always the thing too, is like, you know, you got to get them in and then we're traveling and all that. I'll be, I'll be curious to see if, if he hits the field. Any other thoughts on the the moves the Renegades are making? I know I saw that tweet here this week. Yeah, it looks like they added Brian Harrion as well at the running back position. Devion Smith has been kind of the workhorse. I know Kenneth Farrell just went down last week with, I believe, the knee injury. He's been placed on the reserve list. Don't know a whole lot about Letty Brown or Brian Harrion, but look, they they need an, in, an injection of speed, an injection of uh, you know dynamic ability and some talent in order for them to to start making plays. This offense has just been very milk toast. They haven't had to do a lot because their defense has done enough in recent games to give them that three and two record, but it would be nice to see, you know, Bob Stoops led offense. I, I thought there would be a little bit more pass happy, happy. I thought they would be able to get the ball out to their playmakers a little bit more. I think if Victor Bolden is able to play this week and if not this week next, I think he's immediately the best wide receiver on this team and can hopefully give them some consistency at the position. Yeah, I feel bad, you know, Kenneth, and because he he got signed late, brought in, uh, placed on the injury reserve. I mean, he's obviously a friend of the show, and and I just have tracked him through even all the way back to 2020. So certainly, yeah, yeah I don't feel bad for Kenneth there coming in late and then having to get injured here. Um, this is the game I do think everyone's looking forward to. You know, we just had uh, Brandon Silvers here on the show. That's you know my quarterback all the way back to the Dragons in 2020. Uh, the Monday night game, uh, hopefully, I did. I, you know, hopefully we can spark some ratings here. Uh, seven Eastern feels better. Roughnecks looking good, coming off a loss. I think they're going to be pissy here. And then defenders, uh, this is obviously your game of the weekend. Am I overstating? Absolutely my game of the weekend. And as we say in the fantasy world, this is the Monday night hammer. So they'll have all four games, all three of the, the first games we played Saturday and Sunday. 
And all of us DFS players that are, are heavily invested in this game will be sitting back for Monday at 7 o'clock Eastern, waiting for Brandon Silvers, waiting for this high-powered Roughnecks offense to take on this high-powered rushing attack from D.C. And hopefully we'll watch the scoreboard numbers rack up like a, a lottery machine. And the same thing will happen for the fantasy points. I'm very excited about this game. I will say as a Roughnecks backer, you can check back on the tweets heading into the season. The Roughnecks are my team. I'm a big fan of A.J. Smith. Big fan of the way Wade Phillips is, is handling things and the way that this team is constructed as a whole. I am nervous about John Trey Kirkland. I think that by no stretch uh, can I say that he hadn't gotten lucky on some of these touchdown catches, on some of these long plays that he had. But a lot of that just goes back to him being one of the most talented wide receivers, in my opinion, in this league. I think his loss could be a big one for this team. So it will, be, it will be interesting to see how they step up with Justin Smith, with some of the recent signings that they've made. If these guys like Devon Salter uh, and Ja'Cory uh, Robertson will be healthy and ready to play this week, not entirely sure they will be. But Deontay Burnett, Cedric Bird, Travell Harris, these guys need to se step up and give Brandon Silvers some plus targets uh, to, to operate with because this defender's rushing attack is going to be going from the first whistle and it's going to be tough for them to stop and we just saw we just saw what abram smith did last week the dynamic uh, ability of jordan tamu and uh, Derek king in the backfield under center it's just a lot to deal with and we've talked about it in the usfl but these teams that are willing to zig while everyone's zagging and kind of operate this run heavy approach can have some success if they can be efficient and there's been no one more efficient than this defenders team on the ground so it's a lot of fun to watch from a contrasting styles perspective even for me, someone who likes the uh, the pass happy natures of some of these teams like Houston and Seattle, it's a ton of fun when when the uh, as we call it in our world the established the run type teams uh, can be effective in doing so. So it's a lot of fun to watch this DC team. I like Houston plus two and a half. I don't like it enough to personally bet it, uh, but I, I hope that this game remains close. Maybe we get some overtime uh, here on Monday night and hopefully a lot of points. I was scouring here. Sorry, I was looking to see. I don't have a defender's depth chart yet. And again, they kind of recycle some of these week to week. And the game's not till Monday. So I was looking to see if we had that. We do not yet. So we have the rough next one. I don't I, I don't know if I expect too many changes from DC. They're doing pretty good. My question for you, someone that watched, you know, obviously with the USFL and Tiamu really struggling, uh, you know, even Silvers, and I know he was in the USFL, but some of these quarterbacks getting a bounce back here. Tiamu, you know, is it just are we finding a better use for him here? What do you make of Tiamu? Because it's a, like a different man compared to the USFL. Yeah, you nailed it. You nailed it. And same thing with Brandon Silvers. If you look back to the XFL 2020 days with his with, with just some of his completion rate and turnover uh, to a touchdown interception ratio, been a much improved quarterback for the Houston Roughnecks. And credit to him, credit to A.J. Smith for operating a scheme that has been beneficial to what Brandon Silvers does well. Exact same thing happening for, for Jordan Tiamu. We saw him be very successful in, with the Battle Hawks in 2020, was a very good fantasy quarterback, was a very good real-life quarterback for that team as well. That didn't translate to the USFL. And it was kind of surprising to see that in that Todd Haley system, him not playing very well in that in that pass friendly system. Now he gets back in this this Fred Kais system that's operating him more as a running back, more as a rusher, utilizing his legs a little bit more, getting him out in space, making some of those throws a little bit easier for him. And we're seeing a really dynamic Jordan Tiamu, which is a lot of fun for this league. And that's that's one of the reasons why the defenders are kind of the class of the XFL at this point and really the team with the target on their backs, the team to beat. Well, I think I think we got two good games here. I, I want to see St. Louis at Vegas, and I want to see Houston. I hope that I hope that for my sake, I hope the Dragons game is not good, and we just go in there and absolutely <laughs> kill them. And then that uh, Cody, I appreciate your time. Anything else? Uh, any other thoughts? Anything else you want to touch on before I let you go? I appreciate your time today. No, I appreciate the time, Reed. Uh, we're we're covering everything over at Establish the Run. If you guys are interested in fantasy, any interested in in sports betting or anything, or just want a community of people to talk to, we've got a Discord channel for subscribers as well. So check us out, EstablishTheRun.com. But I uh, appreciate you having me on, and it's always a lot of fun to talk spring football. Well, I like it. It, it was because, again, this is really outside of my wheelhouse. But last year when I kind of – I'm like, I need smart people to talk to about USFL stuff. And I go, oh, my God, like there's all these guys that know <laughs> so much. So I appreciate it. You guys are doing great work over there. And uh, obviously we got the USFL here coming back, and they're in training camps. And, uh, you know, it seems like I'm seeing more social media stuff. I feel like they're – Doing a little bit more. We had the Maulers uniform reveal today. That it wasn't a lot, but you know, I think we're trying there. I think we're getting the USFL steam back going here. Yeah, get the flywheel started. Get the fans. Get the the people talking, and that's all we can ask for. Uh, Cody, appreciate your time. Uh, we'll enjoy this weekend. Thanks again. All right, see you, Reed.
Well, this has to be the highest serving member of any you know, government body here. We have Senator Larry Smith out of uh, Canada. How are you doing, sir? I'm fine. Thank you, Reed. It's great to speak with you. I'm very excited for this. Tracked you for a long time. And then obviously now with all the Hall of Fame, everything with the Canadian football, uh, reached out, thought we could get you on. First off, congratulations on the getting uh, inducted into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. Well, it's a it's a great honor, and there's a lot of people when you look over time, whether it's a CFL or the NFL or any league, where people have made major contributions, and uh, not everybody gets recognized. So I, I feel very very honored to be in that group now. Uh, how did you f- c- find out about it? How did how did you get the news? Uh, I received a call about ten days ago uh, from uh, one of the senior executives of the CFL and said, uh, uh, Larry. Uh, uh, just to want you to know that you've uh, been uh, nominated uh, to go into the CFL um, Hall of Fame as a builder. And I said, well, that's fantastic. And so uh, it came about, I had really no expectations because I've been out of football since uh, 210 and uh, involved uh, in another world uh, in the Senate of Canada. I'm very honored to be here. Uh, but uh, it was a surprise, but I'm, a pleasant surprise is probably the easiest way to explain it. You said you know, that not everyone that contributes or obviously has the ability to get recognized. Where do you view, obviously, as a player and you were a team president and you're the commissioner, where do you view your greatest contribution to the CFL? Well, um, truthfully, there's been a lot of great players in the CFL, and I was lucky enough to play with some of them, including Heisman Trophy winner Johnny Rogers out of Nebraska. Um, I was lucky enough to be one of the first Canadian uh, running backs to actually start in the 70s. We had a legendary Canadian named Ronnie Stewart who played in Ottawa uh, during the 60s. Uh, But after Ronnie, there weren't too many Canadians. And we were regarded sometimes as Canadians to play offensive line, defensive line, maybe linebacker, because we weren't necessarily the greatest athletes. But I never considered myself a great athlete, but I considered myself someone who was capable of doing a lot of things. So I could run, I could catch, I could block and do sort of different things. I could throw a few ducks as option passes. Um, And so uh, I was lucky enough to be drafted number one in Canada and played for nine years. I had a good career. Uh, As I look at my time in the CFL after that as commissioner, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, the expansion, which people criticized, was critical to the survival of the league. And the $18 million of revenue doesn't sound like a large number, but when you're in a smaller league uh, and you have that uh, money coming in with some of your franchises in difficulty because of whether it's lack of funds or poor management. And I know the the XFL and the reiterations of spring football have had those same types of challenges. When you have those types of challenges and you take – a product like expansion of a, of a league and you can get five teams and you last three or four years, whether it's three or four years or five years, whatever it is, it gives an opportunity for new referees to come in, referees from the States, the NFL, CFL changing. You have more American players recognizing, hey, there's a hundred year old league I can play in. It's great football. And so there's lots of opportunities. So I look at the expansion uh, when I was commissioner is probably a major, major element of probably why I was selected. Uh, I would think also helping to rebuild the Montreal franchise. Uh, And that was a very tough experience because we started from nothing. We had 1,800 season tickets in a 55,000 seat facility. And football had not been in Montreal for many years. Uh, But to rebuild that and have 10 years of sellouts and having a very successful football team, we were a dominant team for a decade. And uh, that's pretty impressive when you look at it. Those two combinations probably swung the gates for me to get into the uh, hall. Uh, that's good. And we'll, uh, we'll talk Alouettes here in a minute. They're a team that's near and dear to my heart. We just had Cody Fajardo on here a couple weeks ago, the new starting quarterback there. But in terms of the American expansion and, you know, I, I know one billionth of a percent of the great history of the CFL, right? We're still learning every day and our listeners, but you know, a lot of people view the expansion as a failure. Well, it didn't work. They didn't want to deal with it. Besides the fact that it was decades ago, you know, the world is a completely different place. How do you view besides the monetary, right? We needed the money to survive. How do you view that as a success or failure of their expansion back in the nineties? Well, I think it's important to understand is that when you expose your product uh, into the uh, another market, especially as big as the United States market, 
uh, the U.S. market and the power of the NFL. Um, basically, suddenly you get recognition that, hey, what's this league about? Who are these people? And you have players suddenly who had no, no knowledge of uh, the CFL. Uh, during the 70s, uh, we had uh, great American superstars come out of the NFL near the end of their careers, like Terry Metcalf as a running back, came up and played. Anthony Davis came up and played. Uh, we had super players that came up, uh, and it gave other U.S. players of lesser fame knowledge that they could come up and play in the league. And, uh, I mean, we've been around well over 100 years. So when players come up, when referees suddenly start switching between NFL, CFL, to learn about a different product, and to improve their own skills, which was a major thing. When ESPN suddenly gives us a contract, and at the time back in expansion, back in 1992, it was only a million bucks a year. But now it's on five or six of the uh, U.S. channels. And so it's one of these things that it grows. And at the, at the time that it existed, and when you get into sports leagues, and you know this with the USFL, the XFL, whatever league you want to call, there's moments when you have to pivot and the expansion was a pivot, and the pivot at the time didn't last long, but the pivot worked in that we had Bob Wettenhall come in from the States, bought Montreal. Bob hired me to run the team. We were lucky enough to have Jim Pop as a great, great general manager, and Jim is now tied with the new league. And uh, we had people who contributed to building not only the Baltimore team, which was our best U.S. franchise, but also coming back into Canada and help us rebuild the Alouettes. And we had great players. And so when you look at the combination of all these factors, pivoting in any business is a key element to success. We made a major pivot. We got a great owner in Montreal. And then we had the former owner in Hamilton, but uh, the Toronto Argonauts, David Braley, and the BC Lions. And so once we had those two fellows in to secure the league, then we had other big time owners come in uh, to take over the Toronto Argonauts, to take over the Ottawa franchise, to take over the Vancouver franchise. And so suddenly now, 10, 15 years later, 20 years later, we have solid, strong ownership. So now what do we have to do? We have to make sure we market ourselves and make sure that we do the right things to make the CFL stronger. In terms of that, you know, we've heard even as early as last week, you know, we're expanding to Halifax and we're, you know, we're trying to do that again. And our listeners are primarily American, right? We care about uh, CFL American TV deals, let alone, you know, expansion. And how would you view, you know, trying to expand the CFL today, either physically or marketing wise? You have to understand one of the major success factors behind the National Football League is not only is it a great league and a great history, but you have a huge television contract. How much is your television contract worth? Two, three billion dollars? And so once you have a, a, the exposure, but you have the money and funds behind the exposure, you can then expand your league and expand your franchises and expand your stadiums and make sure you get the best players. And so for Canada, we have a very different economy of scale. You guys have, what, 380 million people in your country? We've got 38 million. So take a, a ratio of 10. And so for our television contract, we'd only have, out of 38, 000, 38 million people, we probably only have, how many, what would you figure, uh, 12, 14 television sets. So when you look at the size of your market opportunity for networking, it, it is reduced. So then you have to make the best of what you've got. And then you have to really build local relationships and national relationships with your sponsors. And then you have to make sure that you have the quality of product on the field so that you're going to get people to come into the box, which is your stadium. How would you grow the game further south? Would, would it be getting it on TV sets, your border, trying to you know, redo what was happening in the 90s? How would you grow the game besides getting a 10th team in Halifax? Well, again, let, let's talk about Halifax for two seconds is that Halifax is a great idea, but Halifax at best is going to be a regional franchise like the Saskatchewan franchise where you get people going to the Saskatchewan Rough Rider games, okay? Drive 10, 12 hours to get there. And so it, it is, a, it is a, a, a social, if you want, type of activity for people. Down in the Maritimes, if you're going to have a franchise, the issue is where do you put the franchise? 
And you have to have a big family, a rich family that's going to get involved, like many of the rich families do in the NFL. Will that happen? Well, yeah, then you have to have a stadium. Well, you can't go to a, a university stadium because our university stadiums are small. They're not like in some of the U.S. Uh, schools where you have 80, 100,000 seats. You know, you've got 10, 15,000 seats. So you have to have a stadium plan in place. And so is it a realist, ec realistic expectation that you will get that type of interest in a regional market? I think it would be fantastic if we could. But at the same time, you have to take your base and build your base. And uh, we've been through very many pivotal movements. We're doing very well right now. And what's the future going to be? The future could be, hey, the new league in the States, they want to have some franchises in Canada because they can come and maybe expand their league. But then again, think television, think about your viewers, think about the eyes in the box that are looking at your, 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 your prog programs, is that it makes more sense uh, for us to try to expand what we have in our own country, if it's realistic, or at the same time, making sure we do the best with what we've got. Uh, I, time's running short here. I'll get a couple in before I let you go. I promise I got the time here. Um, you talked about Jim Pop and you know your relationship. He's obviously with the USFL, XFL here is in midseason. What do you view the you know this right to success or anything of these alternate spring football leagues in America? Well, it, it, it really comes down to the the, the uh, strength of the National Football League uh, is basically that it's a sort of late summer fall early autumn league it's entrenched in terms of the strength that it has it's it's a very powerful operation and uh spring football has been tried uh for you know what two or three gyrations until or incarnations to this point um it'll be interesting to see uh, one of the pivot points they're talking about already is well instead of playing in the spring should we talk, play at the same time the nfl does but play on a different day so that we can sort of leapfrog onto the type of ratings options that exist. And that could be an option. Uh, or do we just focus on making sure that the franchises we have in place right now, we solidify those franchises, we help them to succeed. And once you succeed, then you can add incremental franchises. So there's some options available uh, for the new league. Uh, but it's determined on the strength of ownership and making sure that the people are committed and people don't run as soon as there's some obstacles or some encumbrances along the way. Uh, two questions for me. Do you, do you think there is a place for spring football in America? Well, I, football is such an important fabric at the high school levels, the you know, semi-pro, the, the, the level of football in the States and the penetration is, is, is huge. Uh, it, it is part of, it's a national game. And of course you have national games with basketball and you now have baseball. You shouldn't say now have baseball, but baseball is a long institution. And now you're starting to get the evolution of the national hockey league in the States, which uh, we have to comment to, and say, congratulations to the commissioner for the Gary Bettman for the job he's done. And I met Gary Bettman back when I was recruiting a, a, an owner trying to get a franchise in Portland back in 1991. And he was the assistant to, uh, I think, the, com the commissioner uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the basketball league. And, um, but, yeah, it, it, it really comes down to uh, what options and opportunities does the new league have in the States, how they're managed, how they're owned, and having some stability and making sure that you set the rules and people follow the rules. You can't have entrepreneurs who like to run all over the place and do different things and blow their own whistle. You have to have a real balancing act. That is not an easy thing to do. So for the new commissioner in that league, I wish him the best, luck, best of luck because you have to deal with it, the human dynamics so that you can make this thing grow. Will it grow? Hey, let's see what happens. Uh, last question for me. We'll get you out. I promise it might be 30 seconds over. Just the, the sale here and Pierre coming in, you know, PKP buying the Alouettes. How do you feel about, you know, obviously a franchise near and dear to your heart, how they, you know, their, their health now moving forward? Well, let's put it this way. Um, Mr. Pelado has a net worth of $1.9 billion. Whether it's U.S. or Canadian funds, I, I don't know. But uh, we have been looking for an owner since Bob Wettenhall uh, got sick and passed away, unfortunately. But um, the, the importance of having a local person 
with funds and capacity and the desire to involve themselves in the community. Mr. Pelado is well known in Quebec. Uh, he is very successful. He's a strong-willed individual, but he's doing it for the right reasons. And so now the challenge is how does he launch? How does he execute? How does he put in place some of his personnel so that they can compete right off the bat? Uh, well, Senator, I could talk to you all day. I really appreciate it. I know your time is short. So thank you for spending some time on an American football podcast today talking CFL. All right. Well, it's great to talk to you too, man. Thank you. So what'd you think? Good show. How'd we do this week? Uh, I think it was good. Like I said, uh, you know, the, the joy I get running down, talking to some of these people uh, means a lot. You know, Stormy putting up, coming on the show. Like she doesn't have to do that. You know, Larry Smith coming on everybody else means a lot when people take the time to come on. Uh, means a lot, obviously, when you guys uh, stick around and watch and listen. Special thanks, like I said, Stormy, Larry Smith's office, Senator Smith. And then, uh, you know, congratulations for him as well on his Canadian Football Hall of Fame induction. I don't think I said it at the end of the interview with him. I know I congratulated him at the beginning. So uh, congrats to Larry. I certainly deserve that huge thanks for the Roughnecks crew and the Vipers crew getting players this week. Uh, really looking forward to the Monday night game. Uh, you're probably listening to this before uh, the big uh, Monday night football ESPN two game with the Roughnecks at the defenders. So that should be fun. I uh, certainly appreciate Andrew for coming on and Cody as well. Uh, like I said, uh, thanks everyone. Like and subscribe, get us up to 3,500 subscribers. I know people were excited about the show this week when I posted it. Hope it does good in the viewership and everyone checks it out. Uh, that's going to do it for me today. Uh, thanks as always. Hope you guys have a good weekend. You know, I, you know, I post these memes and stuff like not part of it's a joke. Part of it's not. I think it's funny. We need a theme every week. And I thought this week we did all right with the, uh, you know, is this fine? Is this fine? So hope you guys thought it was as funny as I did. We'll see you next time. Thanks.